TFM. Hi, this is Michael Dorn, Lieutenant Commander Worf from Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Trek FM. Welcome to The Ready Room, show number 233. Too many licks and not enough tongue. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me today is Larry Nemechek. With two seasons of Lower Decks under our belts, we look back at how Mike McMahon's animated take on Star Trek has evolved and how fans have reacted. We discuss finding that perfect balance in storytelling, sprinkling in guest stars, selling commemorative plates, and adding texture to the universe. We also ask whether some moments are a rebuke of modern Star Trek. There's lots to talk about, so let's step into the ready room. Well, Larry, it is great to see you after quite a break. And I'm looking forward to talking about Lower Decks and, you know, keeping with the theme, I decided to join you in your ready room this time aboard this Oklahoma class ship, the USS Stillwater. Excuse me? <laughs> Boy, <I just laughs> We're naming our ship blue. classes after states now, aren't we, Larry? You know, you know, the USS Stillwater where it's Halloween all year long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just, you know, I I came aboard. I, I passed through the shuttlecraft bay on my way up here to your ready room. I passed your shuttlecraft. I know that, you know, just like Riker's got his jazz theme, you've got yours. I, I walked by the shuttlecraft Wilkinson, the Switzer, the Stoops. Oh yes, the killer bee. Well, yeah, actually, we've named them. We've named, they're all bees. We have the uh, Benny for Benny Owen, and then yeah, and then the Bud and the Barry and the Bob, and we're trying to figure yeah. out how to get Lincoln Riley a B word so he can fit in. But, uh, yeah. He can be Binkin Riley. Binkin That's his Riley. new name, Binkin Riley. There yeah. is a guy with a Blinkin Riley with a. Um, there's a Twitter <laughs> handle that's kind of a parody of Lincoln Riley. It's called Blinkin Riley. But anyway. Well, so yeah, it's been a while since we talked and we we did a lower decks preview before the series started, I think right before it started and then I think that was you know, the life's pandemic been so busy in 1918. <laughs> that's yeah, how long that's ago that right. was. <laughs> it's a totally different kind of lower decks, but life's been busy and we haven't gotten back together mm-hmm. to talk, to talk about the episodes we've actually gotten and now that season 2 has finished we thought it would be fun to get together and talk not about each episode individually. We're not going to recap 20 episodes in detail, but talk about the themes that we've seen in the first two seasons of Lower Decks. Right, right, right. I, although, you know, I've got I've got this three volume binder set here of notes that I was going to pull out. But OK, we won't do that. That would be <laughs> um, that would almost be 20 hours of. And, you know, by the way, we talk about two seasons, which is a hefty amount to get to. But uh, yeah. that's 20 episodes which used to be, you know, like not quite, that would be like a regular season in a strike year. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I love how our we've had like, you know, perception inflation here where people talk about, of all the, uh, the live action shows do. Mm-hmm. We talk about seasons so, and it's like, well, you know, but this would have been like a season and a half. Measure it in your years. <laughs> in your old So years. speaking of seasons in a strike year, second season were you disappointed that they didn't end season two of Lower Decks with the shades of gray, like an animated clip show like <laughs> the they did the second show. season of TNG <laughs> during a strike year? No, I wasn't. I was not disappointed. <laughs> like I said, this would have really been like uh, six from the end of season one if we were going to do that. But, you know, if these are right. No, it's amazing. The other thing here, we're talking about Lower Decks and the animation. There's a lot of things here. What's what is you know, people were worried going into to Lower Decks. I wasn't. That people were worried about animation. They were worried about comedy with air quotes. I was, they were worried I about, was a bit skeptical. You know, yeah, they were worried myself. about the guy who did Rick and Morty doing this. And yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I had read, I, I first met or he met me. Mike came up to me at Comic Con about 2012 or 2014 when, when his book warped, you know, the unseen eighth season of, <laughs> of Next Generation and his sense of humor in here. And cl- by the way, there is a Beckett Mariner aboard. I, that's another question I have for him. Was oh right, yeah, was, there is. Is it right. canon for Beckett Mariner to have had a year on the uh, Enterprise 
you know, between uh, All Good Things and Generations before she went to uh, <laughs> DS9 and made a tour of all the big hero shows. But um, I, I had a lot of faith in that. But but I think one of the things that um, people weren't really ready for talking about all these transitions was just how well it was going to translate not only as a cartoon and s- what the serialized versus standalone storytelling would be like. And right. uh, it is a little manic. And t- I was explaining that, you know, that first scene, I didn't realize she was drunk, even though she's talking about Romulan liquor or she doesn't say whiskey. Romulan ale. Whiskey. Yes. Romulan whiskey. Yeah. Is that different than Romulan Mail? But it wasn't until, you know, like two or three viewings later, I went, oh, she was drunk the whole time. That's because it's really off putting when you first sit down and watch it. But it I is, was, actually. Yeah. I was determined to watch the show and I'll take a breath here. But I felt like overall, by the, by the second, by the third, by the fourth shows, it had settled into something really enjoyable. And then, of mm-hmm. course, we kind of look at it now and say, well, that, that ramp up that not only did we enjoy, but I think Mike is very proud of to the fact that they replicated that formula a little bit for second season to ramp mm-hmm. up that season, wrap it, ramp it and wrap it both. It really got beyond just co- well done comedy and a million visual references and Easter eggs to caring about the characters and having, you know, pathos for the characters and having the interaction right. and having them stand on their own. So that's a, yeah, that's a big takeaway. But I remember those early days uh, when people were really worried what right. this would look like and it was easy. And I was a little sideways about it at the beginning, but I was going to hang in there. I wasn't ever about to to give up on it. Well, to give you my perspective, I was one of those people who was a bit skeptical. We did an episode of my podcast called Interface where we talked about it right as it was beginning. And I was optimistic for the series, but I was also, I was unsure how it would translate. Now, there's a lot of humor in Star Trek People always think of Star Trek IV The Voyage Home as being a humorous movie. But if you look at DS9, you know I'm a Niner. There's a lot of humor in DS9. It's probably the funniest of all the series, but it's just sprinkled here and there. And sometimes it's subtle humor. But humor can play well with Star Trek, of course. But when it's it's organic. When it's organic. organic. Yeah. And springs from the characters in the situation, like real life, not like laid on for yucks. Yeah. Yeah, which is why Star Trek IV works so well and Star Trek V does not work well in its attempts to be funny. Although I think Star Trek V is a good movie. I enjoy the movie, but it's obviously trying to be funny because people like Star Trek IV Mm -hmm. and there it's not organic and it feels forced. But in terms of Lower Decks, I wasn't sure. Now, Rick and Morty is something that I had not watched, so that was not a factor in my thinking, although... I was wondering, like, okay, if we're going to have people that write a comedy series like that, Adult Swim type thing, coming over doing Star Trek, how is that going to translate? And then it's interesting that you bring up that first scene with Mariner because I did a rewatch to prepare for our Mm -hmm. discussion today. And it was the first time I had watched season one in quite a long time. And as you said, that opening with Mariner actually is rather off-putting. It's it's Mm -hmm. very frantic. It's too much of an information dump right out of the gate. And it's something that once you get into the series, it's easily forgiven and it's not a big deal. But when I think about a lot of the fan reaction that I see online where people really hate Lower Decks and they say terrible things about Lower Decks and how disrespectful it is to the franchise, which is something we'll talk about later not quite yet, but when I hear those things, I always wonder, like, how can you really think that about the show? But when I went to do my rewatch here, I thought, you know, if I were a Star Trek fan and I watched that first episode and I watched that opening and then maybe I watched the second episode, I might feel that way if I didn't keep going because the writing matures, which is the first theme that I think we can talk about. The writing starts to mature. The stories start to have more meat to them. The characters become more interesting. And I think the series becomes a very interesting series. Yes, it's funny. It's supposed to be funny, but it's not as frantic as that pilot episode is. And I'm I'm thinking that might be one of the reasons people feel that way. It's It's overstuffed with jokes. It's overstuffed with references. And I remember... Also thinking after the first two or three episodes, and I think I probably said this on Twitter somewhere, 
that you can do this for a little while, but can you keep up this pace? Mm -hmm. Can you keep up all these references? And they've actually proven through two seasons that they can. But I think that <laughs> yeah, they that's true. But they do it in a like a less ah uh, fr frantic is the word that keeps coming to right. mind. It manic. Just, it feels yeah, manic is a good word. But as time goes on, as episodes go on, it feels like they get in the references without trying to hit you over the head with them quite right. as much. They say and I, and it, think, it still has. It's like it has stop and go yeah. mania, and they yeah. savor the mania to be zany, but the zaniness. Mm -hmm comes out of the characters and some of it's sweet yeah. like tendy has her own kind of zaniness and rutherford has his kind of like that naive wide-eyed you know the the okie dokie of rutherford can be yeah. manic in moments and then boimler and but you know but now you step back and boimler and mariner are both maturing as as individuals which means that the the writers are getting a handle on things but yeah that's that's mm -hmm. to be expected of any show i also think and the way that sometimes the teasers, it's almost like they're, you know, how some of the, 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 the procedural cop shows now start off with a teaser, like CSI did, you know, all the years of that or law and order or some of these, name a, name a cop show murder of some kind castle. I mean, you know, all over the years, whatever's hot right now. And the opening teaser, the ultimate thing is just to find the body, but the people that right. find the body have nothing, 90% of the time have nothing to do with the plot to come. It's it's like somebody just said the writers room sat around and said, OK, we need two people like we need a couple or we need two guys or two women or two kids or, some, mm -hmm. you know, adult and a child. We need them to do two athletes, two cowboys, two bums, whatever, you know, just think of a situation and you're all caught up in the little. It's like writing a little mini moment scene for acting class. And at the end of it, they find the body <gasps> and that's mm -hmm. it. And then they, you never see those people again. If they were just to get you, they were just for the teaser. Mm -hmm. And there's times when they don't waste that. Although we had the episode this year with the the Denobulans, which was awesome to see Denobulans, mm -hmm. but they didn't really have a lot to do with the rest of the show. But anyway, it's like some of these teasers have been so one off. It's like this is one of the things I want to ask Mike when I have him on my open house in a, in a few weeks. I want to say, did you guys see like Manny Cotto and the guy and and that crew had a big board of all of the index card things they wanted to get to because they knew they had basically one year of enterprise left right here's all the yeah. stuff we want to get to and they're they're just out of the gate they've got a blank slate here in front blank, blank page but i'm just wondering like is there a wall or a page file in somebody's computer somewhere where there's like okay everybody let's brainstorm all the things we want to see or snark on you know or whatever and is there just like a big list that we're going to get to and then as the show builds it'll create its own you know, snark list and reference point, but like with cetacean ops on that list from the very beginning. And they finally, and they mentioned cetacean ops right out of the gate in the first, second episode. Right. They had to. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, a thing with fandom. But I mean, there's a lot, there's all kinds of references like that, you know, or like, did you ever think it was weird that the so-and-sos always used to so-and-so, you know, like the whole thing about the, the dead <laughs> right. regular coming back for which to me is more of an original series thing than, you know, <laughs> no, that if if we could just pause for a second, I love the fact that Shax dies and then comes back and no one's supposed to ask about it. It's just that's like the whole joke, right? Like, what are you doing back? <laughs> so I was, but I'm like, okay, so was that a, and they act like, oh, it's a me, you know, it's like the meta of that is supposed to be, oh, look, here's another Star Trek trope we're making fun of. Or, right. or you know what? The whole thing about the show and the people who were concerned about the comedy I think there was a big, what I tried to say here about Mike's, to me, Mike had proved his metal with his warped book, his, you know, unaired eighth season of Next Gen. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you had to be fan nerd there to do that. To me, Lower Decks basically is the culmination of 10 years of gifs and memes on Facebook and social media. It's like there's a whole industry, much less a fandom, who uh -huh. is constantly coming up with new ways to be creatively wacky with Star Trek. Visually, but the whole point is it's in the family. It's not an outsider writing, you know, funny stuff from the outside. It's insiders just kidding around. Everybody making their bar jokes and their and their you know Facebook and their Instagram memes. It's like turn right. those people loose writing scripts, but you know, you got to string it along with a story and a narrative. Yeah, but the a lot of the meat of the bones of those scripts and story outlines. Is is basically like live and 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 gosh, 
look how well it translates going the other direction. People are just memifying up a storm from Lower Decks. Up to, and some people don't like that kind of humor, or maybe that's not their thing. And maybe those are the people that don't, you know. But I think that there was such a ready, willing audience. You know, the Next Generation era has bloomed and blossomed. That and, weirdly enough, and we should get into this, the reaction to several things. I think these, these are all still broad strokes, so shoot me if you don't want to talk about this yet. But one thing is, I think Lordex, among all Star Trek series ever, is the one series that the most people were either prepared to not like or the most skeptical about at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, lots of people, you know, we had the TNG haters at the beginning, even because it was usurping the the real Star Trek people. Who are these newcomers when it was right. like a binary choice? Right. Are you with old or new Trek? Hmm. And it was like a series. It wasn't generations. It was a series. But I, I think Lower Decks basically flipped the switch in the biggest way of any Star Trek series. I think the huge swath of people, whether they were vocal about it and angry, or they were trying to be polite and hold back, but still express their doubts, like you, it sounds like. I think mm-hmm. there's been the biggest turnaround for Lower Decks on that account than any other Star Trek show ever, the fastest. In fact, I think people, by the fifth or sixth or seventh show of the first season episode, were like, it was like uh, it was like whiplash effect. People were already realizing, oh, my God, I'm in love with this show. And to think I was a doubter, if not a hater <laughs> mm-hmm. at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I and then at the end of the season, I remember thinking, I think this is the most complete, even though we talk about the quick evolution and the first the wobbly moments in the first couple of shows. And, and to me, I could tell a huge difference between Envoys, the second episode. And mm-hmm. and the first one with the the suckling mm-hmm. spider cow and the drunk mariner right off the gate, you know, I could tell a big yeah. settling between the first and second, and then from the third onward, yeah. you know, basically. So I to me it wasn't even like it took that long, but right. it was amazing watching the online reaction of people, much which echoed my own. Or, or I was there to begin with more than most people were, I think, but I was willing to trust it and trust Mike. My thing was like how well that may be his intention, but he's not one guy. He's the top dog. How much, how much leash are they letting him have? How much rope are they letting him have from Alex Kurtzman on down? And also how do you, you know, one general can't control a whole army. And in case you hadn't noticed it, there's, I do believe there's 47,477 names in those final credits <laughs> right. with all the animation people involved. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. From Titmouse. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, but, uh, but yeah. apparently they have a really good chain of command to spawn a phrase there. I mean, apparently I don't know where the decisions are made all along the way and who's doing the checking on the final say so, but it's amazing to see all those names involved and to see it be as cohesive as it is. And I think the first season, by the time it was done, I was like, my God, that feels like the most cohesively and, you know, and out of the gate, the concept was basically there. It didn't have to, You know, the three years Mm -hmm. of Star Trek finding itself on every other series, that just blew it out of the water, rivaled only by the original series, which had to do it because it was, put, you know, set the pattern. And if it had failed, nobody would have cared. And I, there's times when I wonder if maybe it even outshines the original series that way, which was one of the amazing things about the season, too. too. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting point. Um, I think it's easier for this series to feel solid in the first season and not take as long to find its feet because it's built on all the other series. Mm -hmm. It's just constant references to things that we know. So we feel at home and things feel right from the start. And that's why when you were bringing up a lot of people were thinking it was disrespectful. I think it's Mm. the most, you know, and I've seen people say it's their favorite. We can get into a lot of this. It's their favorite Mm -hmm. of the modern Star Trek. Yeah, I've seen people say that. And yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. people say it's their favorite Star Trek period. But they're not they're not unloving original or next gen or DS9 right. anymore. It's like this show is loving everybody else so much okay. while building yeah. its own that it can't help but be that way, which is why when people right. say it disrespects every I'm like, this seems to be the most you talk about the infamous words, it's a Valentine to the fans. This feels like it's DNA twenty four seven is a Valentine to fans. And you yeah. can almost say you're, you're then you're expecting, well, someone's going to critique it and say, oh, that's all it is. It's a Valentine. It doesn't stand on its own. But, oh, no, by the end yeah. of the first season, look, it's standing on its own with its own characters and arcs and, and themes. Right. OK, so that ties in both to 
the writing maturing, which we're talking about, mm-hmm. and why do people dislike it? And you said love, and I've said quite a few times on Twitter that when I'm watching Lower Decks, that it is a fantastic, brilliant love letter to the franchise. And of course, I get a lot of positive reaction to that, but I also usually have half a dozen curmudgeons who butt in and tell me how wrong I am. And some of them say horrible things that trigger the Twitter filters and get their account <laughs> suspended. And I'm wondering, like, how can you be so angry about an animated show? But I don't understand why... I can understand if someone doesn't like it. Absolutely. This kind of thing is not everyone's cup of tea. I get that completely. But the people who say that it is making fun of and belittling Star Trek, that I don't understand. I think either those people just have no sense of humor or it's hitting some personal thing, some nerve in them where maybe Star Trek meant something really important and specific to them Mm -hmm. and it's a very serious thing for them and they just cannot handle anyone mixing humor in with it or what they perceive as making fun of it maybe it's that because i've wondered because the the references the depth of star trek knowledge that is on display in this series could only be done by a group of people who know the franchise inside out and, and and not just the ready and not just the writer the ready room not just the writers room, <laughs> right? That, I think the biggest shock to me I was expecting good content and I was expecting maybe there would be a shakedown cruise with a little bit but I was expecting them to get there eventually or else the thing would mm-hmm. blow up. If, I mean mm-hmm. it's like it either had to get there and I thought Mike could get it there but if something in the structure of just too many moving parts to get that show together and it just didn't fulfill its potential and maybe it maybe it just you know averaged along. And wasn't mm-hmm. great, but it wasn't horrible or whatever. But the thing that, but it, but it got there, and I thought it would. The thing that shocked me the most, I did not. And it, this was episode one, which kind of leavened the blow of not realizing she was drunk and just thinking it was going to be this manic all the time. Mm-hmm. Was the visual? It was like, oh my god, oh, the visuals are incredible. And I know yeah. we're going to get into that. You know, it's a whole, it's a cottage industry now to to yeah. Easter egg everything, and not just mentions. But background and and it is weird when I hear people say it's their favorite of the modern shows, it's the favorite of the current shows, you know, or it's their favorite all time. I think part of that is, and some people are. Try- I was going to say when you're re- when you're looking at your hate online about Lower Decks, not yours, but when you encounter mm-hmm. it, you know, every Tuesday I say check the sources <laughs> online when you get involved with somebody. I mean, can you tell, are they like bots and trolls or are they like real people that you really know who are just really extreme? Okay. They're not people who I know, I would say, but they're people who like you, my account is fairly public known account for Star Mm -hmm. Trek discussion. So people see, even if they don't follow me, they'll end up seeing a lot of the things I tweet about Star Trek. And they're typically, because... I do. I think you do this as well. When you see a comment like that, typically you click through to their profile, scroll yes. down, kind of see what else they've been tweeting to see. see are, yeah. Are they or one look, of these people? they got three that, followers. Oh, yay. Right. Oh, look, they joined Twitter two weeks ago. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 So those cases, like they joined two weeks ago. Yeah. Probably a but. But I do see people who, no, they've been on Twitter for a long time, but if you scroll down, they're just... Yes. Negative Nancys, you know, everything is negative. They don't like anything. Uh, they're complaining about and they Star have Trek no, as nothing well. in their life or commentary range outside of that. It's like yeah, just right. relentless. That's just who they are. Yeah. And so in those cases, I tend to dismiss it and go, okay, well, they're going to complain about absolutely anything. So yeah, I don't know uh, why so people, so many people are upset like that. In, in the situations where I do find people who are legitimately Star Trek fans. And I can tell that, oh yeah, they do love Star Trek, but they hate Lower Decks. I I wonder why they have such a negative reaction to this series 
that they have to butt into other people's conversations to tell people how bad it is. And that's why I think for some people, maybe it's hitting a nerve. It's something sensitive. It's something maybe we don't understand about them. Well, that's and that's been a yeah. facet of social media modern. St- I mean, people who it's one thing, to, you know, if you see people say that over and over, guys, mm-hmm. guys, it's one thing to not like a show or it's not your favorite. Mm-hmm. But when you go out of your way for 12 hours a day, to go stomp on other people's threads to tell the same right. thread 18 times yeah. in a row yeah. that you hate this. It's like, okay, we got it. Like, you know, like, is there everything in your life that you don't like? Do you take the time to go where that world hangs out to tell them how much you don't like it? Well, obviously there are hundreds or thousands of millions of people who do. It's like, is that mm-hmm. how you, you know? So that's a phenomenon that happened. What I guess what gets me is on one hand, all the worries seemed legitimate worries. How would the, cause I had, you know, back in my mind, the best intentions can, you know, no one, that old thing about no one sets out to make a bad movie or no one sets right. out to make a bad, you know, series. Lots of good intentions might not come to fruition, but that's not the case here. This wasn't even average. And and I say this all the time too, like don't mistake online fandom for all fandom and don't mistake right, like con- convention fandom even for all fandom. There's the vast right. armchair fandom out there. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but of any of the series, Discovery famously, Picard has, has some boxes of people who didn't enjoy it or appreciate it. But mm-hmm. again, I think Lower Decks flipped the switch of the people who were the most fearful of it they didn't want to see it fail, but they were worried about that. It seemed like a big risk in an experiment. It was definitely not going to be, you know, animated TAS version two. It, this was going to have a personality and a totally different mark for all those reasons. And it feels like 80% of those people have not only gone, phew, in relief, but they're like raving maniacal lovers. <laughs> mm-hmm. They're huge fans. And I say mm-hmm. this again with the caveat that convention fandom is not everything. But I, the last, I did my, you know, State of the Trek fan forum at Vegas and it was the last panel on the Roddenberry stage. So it wasn't a huge audience. We had like, there were like 150 with maybe 50 people scattered around the edges. So I'm going to say 200 people there. And I did a quick poll and I was like, is there anybody now that it's, I mean, it, it easily won my point about, I did show of hands, you know, like I do with all kinds of things. Like when, you know, what was your favorite? What, what track brought you into the fold? All that. But mm-hmm. with this one, I was like, did you, how many people started off being trepidatious about enjoying or absolutely, you know, word sick or not liking, thinking it was a mistake about Lower Decks? And then you're totally a fan now, or you were totally won over and you're almost in shock because you're in <laughs> And that was like most of the room. And then I said, okay, so is there anybody here who doesn't care for, you know, I don't say hate. I say, is there anybody here who really doesn't care? And out of that 150 people, I can still see him. One guy over at about 11 (laughs) o'clock from me on stage, Mm -hmm. you know, it was like, well, and he wasn't like a raver and a hater. He was like, well, I just don't. And I'm like, that's fine. And then like the whole audience and nobody, people either didn't say anything or they, Mm -hmm. you know, stood up to defend or talk about what they enjoyed. But the only person given a chance where, like, you see negative, like your negative thing online, people would jump in. And I was totally expecting a few. But it's that's why I say I think Lower Decks has has captured the heart of fandom. Yeah. Even when they weren't well, expecting to be right. more than any of the modern shows and maybe even yeah. the older shows. And it's partly helped along by the fact that it loves all the other shows and that helps grease the wheels, yeah. you know, well, its favor with old yeah. fans. I think. I think that's an important part of it. And, but I also, I've been thinking about why this is true, what you're saying. And, and I think I know, I, at least this is what I think the reason is. Before that, just to close out my love letter bit, I just wanted to say that anyone who loves something so much that they have this encyclopedic knowledge of it, the way that the mm-hmm. people putting the show together do, they're not going to be making fun of it because they they have to love it to know it that well. You don't know anything that well if you don't love it. And that's why I don't understand people who think that the, the writers, they've set out to make fun of Star Trek. That I don't get. Now, as for why people have really latched on to this series, why is it their favorite? I think that the core reason... The obvious is that there are all these references that we know because those of us who are diehard fans, you know, we've seen every episode a dozen times 
all the series. So we know this stuff inside out. And then when we see it on the screen, we're like, wow, you know, that's, that's that thing. That's that thing. I know it. I know it. And so we love that. But I think the other thing is that it just recaptures the classic formula right. of Star Trek. And when I say classic, unfortunately, it's 2021. So I'm also talking about the 1990s. It's the TNG, specifically, it's the TNG DS9 Voyager Enterprise era of Star Trek. It recaptures says, You that- can talk about 2005. That doesn't sound quite so ancient, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it recaptures that. And yes. it especially... And you know they've set out to do this, even things like using the typeface from the next mm-hmm. generation mm-hmm. for the episode. Well, first of all, just putting the bloody episode title on the screen at the beginning. I mean, thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And then having the credits and having it all be in the next generation typeface is awesome. And the format of the show, it it, it finds this perfect balance of the... TNG episodic storytelling while mixing in a little bit more of the DS9 Voyager mm-hmm. Enterprise serialization where we're following the characters through. And then that's why I said recently that what I love about Lower Decks is that these stories are about our characters, their lives, and how the stories affect them. Because that's what always made Star Trek so great. And if you look at the modern series, Discovery in particular, because it's already had three full seasons now, and it's not quite as much of a a special niche show as Picard is in my eyes. I, I like Discovery. But the thing about Discovery is that every season is about some galactic ending yes. cataclysm yes and and the, will be again and it will and oh my god i'm sorry when i saw the trailer Oops, for season did I trigger four you there uh chris i'm sorry <laughs> no i'm looking forward to it i am and and i and i like discovery perfectly fine however okay i'm going to take a little sidetrack here please I'll, a little rabbit I'll ju- hole. if i can jump in your rabbit yeah. hole with you for a second but yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna be just like alice oh, and i'm gonna go down that rabbit hole <laughs> since we're talking about discovery here At the end of season three, I thought they have a kind of normal mission. They need to help rebuild the Federation. They need to get Mm -hmm. dilithium out to these worlds and pull everything together. They'll be dealing with planets and cultures and people and leaders. Season four is going to be interesting. It's going to be like they have a new mission in the future. And then the trailer came out and it's like, oh, great. The universe is going to end again if they don't do something. Like what? Chris, it wasn't even that. I thought the idea of a trailer, a teaser trailer or a promo trailer was to yeah. like create excitement and get people a lot of tastes <laughs> and things. And I watched the trailer and I'm like, okay, so it's like people's faces looking dramatic and people floating. Right. And people looking dramatic and then floating and then people floating up and then coming down and then floating and then faces and then faces yeah. and then floating and people talking about how it's a gravity thing. And then more faces, and then more floating, and I was, and that was it. I was like, "Well, that wasn't I'm like, <laughs> okay, we, I get it. It's a gravity, yeah. you know, it's a gravity ellipse." I was just right. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, the purpose of this discussion isn't <laughs> to to get too far into right. discovery and what they're doing. But you're, and I am looking forward to seeing what yes, they're going to do. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Because I know my, my I have point, all the. Yeah, don't do a yeah. Beastie Boys sabotage on this. I mean, there <laughs> hopefully will be more than what you got in the trailer. But well, your point well, was. was your point was there a good will one. Be. Yeah. But my point is that in Discovery, characters are secondary to plot. Mm-hmm. And in good storytelling, it should be the other way around. It's why DS9 is such a wonderful series, because the characters come first. DS9 is the series that has the biggest conflict, this huge war going on. But... As I always say, and I've said on this show many times, DS9 is not about the Dominion War. DS9 is about how the Dominion War affects our characters. And the characters always come first. And that's what I'm seeing in Lower Decks, and, is and, that the characters DS, come first. Yeah, and while DS9 is doing that, it's giving you the most friggin' amount of characters any Star Trek show ever gave you. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but I think that... I think these two things are why people are latching on to the series, or maybe three things. 
One is there are all these references that we know and we love seeing it and we love knowing that we got it. Mm -hmm. The second is that it recaptures that classic formula of Star Trek storytelling that is missing from the modern series. And then the third one is that characters come first. And that's, uh, I guess, another thing that we talk about are just the characters a little bit and how they're developing the characters through the series right. so that we actually care about these cartoons. And I think I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to mention it somewhere along the way, but I, that whole point about what people, the, the very vacuum that people that led people to, it wasn't about the storytelling. It was the performances and the writing and surprise mm-hmm. CBS slash Paramount plus now, but the whole Ensign Mount and, you know, you, you yeah. can tell that, um, Promoting Spock as a character was the big push out of the. Here's the big PR plan for the year. Da, da, da. And Ensign Mountain Pike, you know, and he pulled Spock and number one along to it. Rebecca remain along with him too. But you could tell that that like totally took everybody by surprise. It was a pleasant yeah. surprise. And I said, for yeah. once, they're having pleasant surprises again, not being, you know, bombed by the outside world and the online community. To have a, something go right was a nice, you know, even as they fired the showrunners fourth of the way in. But to have something go so right that, of course, they stood up and, and and kudos to them to go, we should take this while it's hot and, and have a pike in it. Like, do what the people want for once. And, you mm-hmm. know, and if we have to bump Section 31 and everything else down the line, we're, we're going to do this first and we're going to do this next. And it's feeling like it was the right decision, but it wasn't just do a pike show. It was couple it with this. Again, people so the, the haters would say this could never happen. But they're actually paying attention to the tea leaves, the Earl Grey tea leaves there and saying, hmm, maybe we should do a uh, more standalone-ish traditional planet of the week, you know, morality play of the week format, still having, but still having a mature theme. We say running arcs, but not like serial where every show has to be, you know, surprise reveals, mystery reveal, mystery reveal. And it's all just this jerky breaks gas breaks gas mm-hmm. kind of you know the clutch is going out kind of storytelling and i wonder if sec if um strange new worlds under that guise had come along before lower decks if it would have been as big an impact in lower decks but the point is mm-hmm. i don't think the world was looking for it i mean everything you just said about people people knew that's what they didn't like about discovery especially now me i can I can totally separate. A lot of people lump Picard and Discovery in together. I can totally separate Picard yeah, sure, from Discovery. Yeah. And to, to Discovery has come, a, again, Discovery's come a long way since it's had the worst birth of any. It wasn't its fault, but the worst right. birth of any Star Trek series ever. Even losing right. your captain casting was nothing. And you're talking to what, about behind the scenes stuff, not I'm talking on about screen the, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. talking, well, and how it reflected on screen. You know, right, you basically right, right. had three but, but eras of listening, writing. Yeah, but for people listening, when you say the worst birth, you're largely talking about turmoil in the process right. rather than right. the and, on-screen and material. Going being through th- yeah. three teams of creatives, and by the time the third team right. came in and realized there were things they wanted to fix, the money had been spent, things had been built right. and committed yeah. to. And you know, and that's why I was preaching that the second season would be more settled, and it was, mm-hmm. even though they they lost their – they fired their show, Aaron and Gretchen, like a few episodes mm-hmm. in. And yeah. then the third scene, you know, Michelle Paradise. Anyway, we're not talking about Discovery, but right. I yeah. can separate Picard. But still, the right. fact is people had a – however degree they, 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 you know, voiced their anger, displeasure, or just kind yeah. of their tummy upset. Whatever stage they were in on the spectrum, people had that gut feeling. And the last thing they're thinking – and they're just worried about Lower Decks being, you know, too comic and all that. The fact that whether they realized it or not – that Lower Decks was feeding that hunger, Mm -hmm. you know, was quite naturally and organically the DNA of Lower Decks all along was going to be to get back to that. But they didn't preach that. Right. Because I I think part of it also is they got to walk a tightrope and going, ha, 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 all that stuff you hate about the new shows or you just feel like is missing, we're going to give it to you because we're going to be, you know, they can't, they're not, that's not the point. They're not trying to one-up their sister shows at all. Right, right. No, no, no. No, no, no. But just just organically as part of the vision of the show, not as an intention, I think, to fix what people were not getting or to give them Mm -hmm. their fix. I don't think that was part of it, but it quite, it totally fell into that. Everything you said, it totally fell into that niche. And mm-hmm. I don't think people, I think people were so relieved about the whole comedy and, 
you know, it's not going to be making fun. Most people, it's not making fun of. It's a love letter. I get mm-hmm. how Star Trek can look as as animation. People were so caught up in that whole meme and and, and bubble and and relief that I don't think it even started to sink in that it was giving them standalone shows with a planet of the yeah. week and a morality play of the week and all that. Even as it gave you running, you know, running right. runners about oh she she's her daughter. Oh no, it's been revealed and how to you know and all that. And then the second season, the whole even. Even with Packlids, and we're going to get to that too, but I, I think it fell into that. And I think most of fandom didn't even realize it, but that was part of also the satisfaction that they were getting from Lower Decks without even mm. thinking about it. But I, you know. I think it, that was there underneath in people's thinking, I believe. And it's interesting you bring up the point of what if Strange New Worlds had come first before Lower Decks? Mm-hmm. Would Lower Decks have been received? as well as it has and would people have fallen in love with it as much as they have because i do think that i do think that people love lower decks not just because they think it's funny or they love the references but because it's like that comfort food like they feel mm-hmm. like they got their star trek back and so i think if strange new worlds had come before lower decks maybe it it would have enjoyed all the love that Lower Decks is getting. Well, it's going to do that anyway because it is live. It is going to do and that anyway. And we're assuming they I, pull it off, and I'm really hoping they do. Oh, I think they will. And I'm, think, yeah. I'm very excited about Strange New Worlds because I was blown away by Anson Mount's portrayal of Pike. And well, right. well one guy can't it, do it all, and I was blown away when um, – and I go back to this and I preach on it. Go back on YouTube, everybody, and find it. Not this year, but last year's Star Trek Day panels – when they basically had the writing staff, the writer's room for Strange New Worlds in with uh, uh, Akiva Goldsman and Henry Alonzo mm-hmm. Myers, who was the showrunner. Mm-hmm. But the three other writers on the panel all got emotional talking about how they had been mm-hmm. fans and what it meant to have that. And they'd all had other credits yeah. and they'd worked on other shows. But, oh, my God, now it's my chance to screw up Star Trek and be hated forever. Or I can do the good thing and do what I mm-hmm. wanted to do when I was a kid and write stuff, you know, but to watch them all get verklempt about talking about it. I was like, unless yeah. something totally beyond their control screws this show up, this series is going to be in really good hands. And so, yeah, I've had mm-hmm. a good I've had a good vibe about it, too. I'm right. still mystified why they haven't put a promo out unless it's just the fact they know we have to wait till next summer and they don't want to get you too hungry while they're promoting everything else. Well, that might be it, because yeah. I they, they've got so much stuff in production right now that. I think they do have to think about when they promote what and in what well, order and we're they about do. to promote to think about that. you know a whole new show and a new season of a, a show within a yeah, month's right. time here. Yeah, exactly. So. so but I think Strange New Worlds, everything we know about it, it's gonna take us back to that style of storytelling mm-hmm. that we all that caused us all to fall in love with Star Trek in the first place. But of course, it's going to have a modern sensibility to it, but it's not going to be the, we've got 12 episodes to prevent the universe from collapsing in on itself and all sentient life dying. And then we're going to do it again next season. It's not going to be that kind of thing. And I think that if it had come first, it would have filled that need for people. But instead, Lower Decks came first and Mm -hmm. Lower Decks filled that need for people. And I don't think it's like people were sitting around like, oh, God, I really want to have this back. But I think that there were a lot of fans who they were really excited about Star Trek Discovery when it was announced and they couldn't wait for it to start. And then once they got a few episodes into it, they thought, "Eh, this is not really working for me. And they've been waiting to get Mm -hmm. something that's like the Star Trek they love. And most people aren't, you know, online screaming about Discovery to other people. They're just quietly waiting. Right. Hopefully one day I'm going to get back that Star Trek I love. And I think Lower Decks is that format. And Strange New Mm -hmm. Worlds, I think, will be that format. And hopefully it's sort of... I think there's room within Star Trek to have both types of storytelling. It's just that if you only have the galaxy-ending cataclysm and you don't have the morality tales and the episodic type stories then that's where fans feel like they're being left out yeah and and again we're doing lower decks but that whole galaxy and a cataclysm as the years streaming serialized 
tone. I thought that was already like a ridiculed trope of the movie. You know, the whole it's the Enterprise is the only ship in the gal- in the quadrant that could do this. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Cl- you know, uh, over the top drama was already yeah. made fun of and was a thing out there that was floating around every time any kind of new idea for new movie, you know, and oh, look, it's going on into the Kelvins, too. Yeah. And the idea that people are going back to that for sorry, I won't go there, yeah. but I think well, I think I think there would still have been that whole thing about if if Strange New Worlds had come first. I still think that people would have fallen in love with Lower Decks. I think it would have yeah. been. I think that's. Yeah. A, I'm not talking about a big chunk. I think it holds its own, and it would have been anyway. And I think that glow we were talking about was maybe not not anybody's number one choice anyway. So I think that's a ten or fifteen or twenty percent layer of of adulation now that might have been yeah. lessened it wouldn't go away let's, people would go let, yay it's another one yeah. that's doing this L- let know. me put it this way i think that if you had the two side by side which show has a bigger hurdle to overcome with fandom a show with pike spock number one uhura live action live action yeah or an animated comedy series. Yeah. The Pike show is going to be the one that fans are going to be more ready to jump on board with. So what that means is that what Lower Deck has done is even more impressive. Exactly. That they've, exactly. they've made everyone fall in love with them as mm-hmm. they have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now people demanding ask you, it. People buying the t-shirts of the, you know, the other week and all uh, that. Of the Ritos. Yeah. yeah let, the let me ask you another question. Now, one complaint some people have had about Lower Decks is the nudity which has yes. popped up yeah. maybe more often than people think. Now, people got really upset. And of course, you know, social media outrage happened after the whole naked time thing where mm-hmm. it was a, a bit sexual. People but got it's... really crotchety about that show. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> but but it's hardly the first time we've had nudity on Lower Decks. It actually happened quite a few times. We had the, the all nude Olympic training center right. we have the sonic showers which was like a, yeah the sonic showers is big they, they all nude the uh the nude olympic training room main, yeah. men's training room was like a punchline like a visual a quick like two second and it's out of the commercial or out of right the act yeah right. exactly and you yeah. almost didn't get to linger on it but yeah the the sonic shower group shower room is lingering and right. then but good old boimler and his and his uh sensor bar yeah. but <laughs> yeah right but so the question is do you think that at times the show is too adult? Does it go to the adult swim side too much? Is it a problem for fans who want to watch it with their kids, but then there are these moments right. that make them feel like, ah, I'm not sure about this. And they come out of left field, kind of pop up and you're like, oh, I, you know, right. could, could you have warned me about that just for a second? Mm-hmm. I, I, I wonder if there's a, and here's the thing, kids and parents are all over this all over the you know spectrum too, as far as what they do. And I you know, there's times mm-hmm. when I go, Oh, me and a twelve year old, that wouldn't have been a big deal, we would have laughed. Me and a in a six year old or a, yeah, I don't know. Um and I get you know, parents will find their way there. And then I see some parents with young kids that kind of poo poo the whole thing and go, Oh, it's not that big a deal. And then some people who are, you know, very um conscientiously they they enjoy it, but they just don't think it's what their kids. So I, right. you know, I said I said they don't use this branding because it's not their, it's not their, not their corporation. But I said, you know, Lower Decks is early on. I said this is not the kids show. You know, Prodigy will be the kids right. show, right? Yeah, just because yeah, yeah. it's animation. Yeah. This is the Adult Swim show, guys, and that it's it'll be adult and snarky. I didn't know how adult, but I knew that the the style of humor would be there, and maybe it's too much for a ten year old to get, or maybe. Maybe I don't want to underestimate the kids who were born with, you know, digital DNA in their in their genes. Uh, they're mm-hmm. pretty smart and savvy here. Every generation's, you know, going down that path. So I is it too much? I mean, I I did kind of wince a little bit at the spread eagle Boimler in the moment. I mean, although what they're doing, if you're going to take the naked now, it's like we remember how naked time and naked now both talk about all the naked people frozen right. in the showers and all that. Right. We just didn't like see it. It wasn't in our yeah. face. Well, right. Of course, that's what Lower Decks is going to focus on. And yeah, and they did some intriguing couplings when they were doing that, too. The Lower Decks right. is very subversively, you know, modernistic yeah. as you're laughing at things. They're doing all kinds of things with gender and, and everything, but uh, really breaking ground as it flies by in that manic pace. But 
<laughs> I heard, you know, I heard Mariner once again say, I was doing the rewatch, and when she says, yeah, but I only had that triple for personal reasons, <laughs> for personal uses. And I was like, okay. Um, but that's a verbal, right? There's no, the yeah. visuals are what grab people. So, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I was a bit. So my, my, to answer your question, it doesn't bother me, but I right. notice it because I'm thinking of the people with kids yeah. and I'm thinking if this was when my kids were little, but then when my kids were little, it was, that wouldn't have been a thing because it was, you know, back we're in the next gen days and Rick didn't want to put the Edosians or the Edo people in, in justice were like a, a screaming extreme, you know, Gene right. getting back yeah. at the seventies censors in the late eighties. <laughs> well, for me, it doesn't bother me at all. And I, I think it's kind of funny when they do things like the Sonic shower scenes and the yeah. the naked naked time naked now thing was if i had been in the writer's room if i had been on the production i probably would have been someone who raised my hand and said you know i think this is really funny and it's what a lot of people think when they hear the title but maybe we should not do this because it's going to ruffle feathers in a way that we don't really need is is it worth it? I guess I would say to do it. Yeah, and you could do it, and but there's yeah. like there you could do three fourths of what they did, and it was okay. Right. The, but when you went be, to two or three bits, yeah. yeah, yeah. Within the context of what they were doing, where they were they were bringing to life various episodes based on the titles of the episodes and all, I thought, well, okay, it makes sense, and yeah, it's fine. Also, I don't think of this as a kids show. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if my kids were young. I'm not sure I would let them watch this show to start with because it's not just the nudity. There's a lot of stuff in this show that I would have to think twice about if I had young children. So just because it's animated doesn't mean that it's right, right. for kids, you know. So, But anyway, everyone has different Or you get into a habit where you screen this. it and then you decide it's some Star Trek well, I can show the kids, fine. Yeah, that's pretty pretty what I would do, yes. That's what I would do. I did notice there were quite a few people on Twitter who screen capped the Boimler oh, sure. spread eagle with the bar thing and posted it with angry comments about, mm -hmm. is this what Star Trek has become? And and then I was thinking, please put things into context. Okay, that that is like a third of a second that that went by. And look at everything else that's being produced, even within Lower Decks. And Let's tone the hyperbole down a little bit, please, is how I feel about those I, I'm types sorry, of Chris, you're asking posts. Twitter to have context <laughs> and to uh Right. <laughs> or but the that trolls. Takes of us back. That takes us back mm -hmm. to what well well these people are usually not trolls. These are like actual fans who are they're really upset about it. And I can understand, yeah, that they're bothered by it. But I think that the outrage rings hollow when you do something like that. But it takes me back to what you said earlier in our discussion, which is that Twitter fandom, social media fandom, is not a reflection of fandom right. at large. It's always a, a very small sampling of how people yeah. feel. What I call armchair fandom. People just sit at home and watch the shows and they maybe read the books and they might buy action mm -hmm. figures and... Right. They might play not, they might play Starship Clue where it's the counselor. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I had to like what did are they playing Clue on a Starship board? <laughs> I know. I was like, that was awesome. What? What? I love those I kinds like, of things. Oh, yeah. 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 It's a total those non sequiturs. It's like okay. Yeah. It's kinda of like an updated version of Fizbin or something, except they're not trying to get out of, you know, alien clutches. <laughs> but it was just like, <laughs> what? Okay. It's just uh, so fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then there are the things, you know, the the cursing that goes on, which they bleep out, which I think is, they do it for different reasons. Like, sometimes it just makes the scene kind of funny because it's so out of place. Right. And then sometimes I think that they're doing it kind of poking fun at modern TV shows yeah. where people curse a lot. And not, not just Star Trek, because we've had the couple of things in Discovery where it's happened, but... Recently, I've been watching a lot of Apple TV Plus shows, The Morning Show, C, uh, Ted Lasso, all these shows, and they really just go overboard with the F words in there. And in Ted Lasso, it's funny because it's one character, Roy Kent, doing it, and it's his personality. Mm -hmm. But 
like on the morning show, it's all the characters and it's like every fifth word. And it almost makes me feel like- But that's the industry, Chris. That's well, the way it is when people are under high pressure situations. That's- well, to be honest, the morning show setting, it actually does feel a bit realistic. I, I can imagine that, yeah, maybe it's like that, but toned down a bit, like not that much. But then there are other shows where yeah. you could just eliminate those words and actually it would be easier to follow the story. It would so be anyway, half hour episodes. I, yeah. I think sometimes they're I sometimes in lower decks I feel like maybe they're poking fun at these modern TV shows that do this. And then in the case of Ta'ana, who to me is like Dr. Pulaski, mm-hmm. I feel like I can imagine. If Dr. Pulaski were a new character on a new Star Trek series today, she might be like that. But in the late 80s, when she was on there, you wouldn't do that on TV. But I could totally see Dr. Pulaski's personality being that she curses a lot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I feel like with Ta'ana, I feel like they're channeling Pulaski as maybe Pulaski should have been when they do that. So there are different reasons why I think they have the cursing that they bleep out. I just, every time Tana, we get a bit of her being in the cat box or her coital hooks or whatever, you know, yeah. the, the scratching, yeah. whatever the meow or running with the catnip or whatever wacky thing it is where you're yeah. going back and forth between, oh, look, it's a bipedal uh, a felinoid. I just thinking, we've come so far since Maris. It's like, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it was like it's so sedate and sit. Of course, that was the animated <laughs> series anyway, but. Were they going to let Mar- – like, what's the wackiest thing, you know, they ever let Maress do? But anyway, I, right. I, I, it's just like, yay, species, we're finding out about the, the realm of vacations and they're – yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move on to a few more things. Wow. Um, we talked about DS9 it. a little bit already. There's some interesting oh. DS9 references in this show, especially, like, actually having a model of the station. <laughs> can, I, can, I, well, can I just say this? So ever since uh-huh. – speaking of Tana, ever since they had the encounter – where I think it was uh, Tendi mentions Jadzia and Tahana says, uh, who is that? I don't know who that is. And it's like a fourth of... She doesn't know Dax, right? What did I say? Yes, Dax. You said Jadzia specifically. Oh, but, okay. But we yes. also have the other Daxes. Right, so right. She, she, says, she just I don't know doesn't da- know Dax. Right, yeah. right, right. And and a fourth of fandom seemed like it melted down about that. What do you mean she... Mm-hmm. Like it was a personal insult to the memory of... Terry Farrell or to or, or to Nikki DeBoer, you mm-hmm. know, kind of a thing. Yeah. It's like, no, it's like to me, it's, you know, hashtag texture, not trivia. It's like, let her not know. It's not like da- it's like, let's step back and look at what the real world. This is so Jadzia died. And now and now Esri has the Dax character and we think got through the Dominion War and is probably still alive. But in any case, it's the science officer on DS9 and yes, said Daxes. So the whole realm of Daxes, a lot of them were civilians. A lot of them were tied just to Trill. They weren't. It, they one of them Dax, slept with bones. Yes, on Earth. <laughs> and Ta-ana, in Mississippi. Ta- yeah, Tana is a is a Cation. She's a yeah. doctor, which meant she spent tons of time doing her craft and then saving people. Right. But my point is, I'm. This is not like saying. You know, the original series or Next Generation is a better show than DS9. It's like in their world, people know Kirk and Spock are legends and Picard and Data and Worf and Riker. They're legends and lo- Riker's a living legend still. Yeah. And Miles um, O'Brien is the most important Well, now I was going to get to that. Yes, <laughs> in Starfleet. But my point is... Dax in that context is one of thousands of wonderful people. Now, somebody said, well, you know, the, what's what's Dax's claim to fame that would be beyond just her little life on Trill or in her little role in Starfleet, whatever it was in whichever host she had. One, he or she, I should say, they. Yeah. But uh, God, the original gender uh, champion there, pronoun champion. But the biggest connection to history might be co-discovering the wormhole, the Bajoran wormhole. OK, fine. But there are lots of people who have like one big, huge, you know, the mm-hmm. person that discovered name a medical or a scientific achievement and name name me the person that discovered or invented it. You probably can't. So, you know, that but I just thought it was really weird how they took it as a personal affront against the memory of DS9. And it quickly morphed into why, you know, why doesn't Lower Decks like DS9? They don't ever like they reference original series and next gen and everybody else all the time. Everybody else gets a mention. Hell, they talk about Archer more than they do. 
And I saw that pop up the last few weeks, which I went, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Okay, number one, yeah, if nothing else, uh, O'Brien is the most famous person in Starfleet in another few few decades. So, and yeah, he started on Next Gen, but, you know, Dominion War, please and thank you. Okay. But, you know, and the same for Worf. Worf rose to huge prominence on DS9, right? Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. But, yes, they... I think he's had at least one, if not two. Uh, Rutherford's had a DS9 model kit, and when Tendy gives yeah. him the second one, he says, "Oh, good! It comes with a Jadzia and an Esri." Right. You know. You know. I mean, there's well, all kinds of DS9 mentions. And Mariner and talks about her visits time. to DS9. Nine. I'm, yes. I'm pretty sure there's actually a sea, uh, animated yes. station with the ship docked yes, at the station the too. Yes. So, I mean, yes. There's there's there are a lot of DS9 references in this show. So I'm surprised people would feel that way, but. And if you separate yeah. when they mention like heroes, which is another kind of a thing, I think early on caught people by surprise, especially the first couple of episodes piling mm -hmm. on, you're talking about the Easter egg, but when they just mention Kirk and Spock and Worf and Picard and data over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and people are like, Oh, what is just because they think we're all Star Trek fans. And we won't think like how, how, how realistic is that to be mentioning these people as opposed to all the okay. other famous people. And what I said, okay, out of the gate yeah. was, no, that's fine. That just shows how truly legendary they are. I yeah. said, look, how, you, you right. got to be pretty famous to get your own show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, let's use this to transition to another topic that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So, Tana, she doesn't know who Dax is. She's not heard of, of Dax. But Mariner seems to know everything about Every episode of Star Trek that has ever been aired. So let's talk about the point of view for a moment here. What you mean, and Chris, is that she has read the mission logs of every single damn ship in Starfleet. Is what you well, mean. she has, but <laughs> she just skimmed them just so she knew so she could make fun of them. That's all. That's exactly. exactly. But, <laughs> no, but again, this doesn't bother me, but it it does... I do notice it from time to time. And I think that it can take people out of the story because you're sort of breaking this wall between the character and the writer mm -hmm. where you're telling the story through the point of view of largely Mariner on Lower Decks. And the references that she makes to things that happened in past episodes are sometimes just too much for any actual real person to know these things. There's the scene where they're down on the planet and they have the spears and she's like, oh, spears, how's that? What am I, Kirk? Is this 20 whatever, you know? Yeah. What is it, the 2260s? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that one in particular, I thought, ah, really? That joke's a bit too much, I, I felt. And I just, I think that some people who don't like the series very much as we've talked about before it may be things like this sometimes where it just feels like mm -hmm. you've got a main character that's just spewing the star trek encyclopedia instead of being a real person in universe who should have an appropriate level of knowledge of events that happened a hundred years before she was born yes now yeah, but I will to jump in, and that kind of made me queasy at the beginning, especially the way the mm -hmm. first the first episode ends, right? Mm -hmm. Where she they're in they're selling you know, the lower yeah. decks, lower, and she's yeah. spouting on. Yeah, she yeah, gets yeah. into Gary Mitchell, and she gets into you right. know, and she's yeah. going. She's but she's manic herself. Even for manic shows, she's manic there at the end. But I would say, not she, uh, here's a case where I think sometimes we hear one person doing this, and we broad brush. And yes, the scene where they're all tr arguing over what the exact humming tone is for the different warp engines on now, different ships. I thought ships. that was funny. <laughs> see, that's, that, see, that's a case of throwing everything in there. And, oh, yeah. but the Voyager sounds like this. But It's like, why? Yeah. Well, obviously, Voyager became very famous. It was historic. But look, 900 years in the future. But they wouldn't know what the engine sounds like, of but, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're, <laughs> unless they're listening to the vocal logs. But here's my point. Yeah. When we get to the finale of season one, what do we learn? I think there have been like random quips back and forth. and But it, Boimler is us. When he goes, uh -huh. what? You know Riker? And right. she's like, yeah, but, but how, do, how do you think I got my contraband? And then when you find out that Riker and her mom, basically, you know, we're either in the academy together or they are, they served together early in their careers or whatever when they were younger, right? 
Yeah. But if you stop and think about that, she knows Riker to the point where he's getting her crap. And he's like, you know, he's playing. <laughs> he's got the little Kirk twinkle himself still to the point yeah. where, you know, Troy's like, we're going to talk later. And she grew up that way because her mom was buds with Riker. And if it's not so much about we're hanging out 24 seven, but oh my God, just think of the stories her mom, either she saw her mom living firsthand as a little kid or that she's heard a million times. And then she referenced, I mean, she experienced in her own way. And the, and the, the ticking thing that everybody overlooks is Mariner has a peer with Armina who is a captain. Mm-hmm. Mariner is like, we never get into age. And she said that she's at the very first episode, she says something about she and Boimler have known each other a year, which is interesting. Well, she and Boimler are the same age because they, they do mention that on screen. Okay. But she's got a, a, an equal peer within two or three years of her at the Academy, yeah. who is now Captain right. Rank, which to me yeah. means she talks about being promoted and cut back, promoted and cut back all the time. Yeah. She's been around the block enough where she could have been a junior, you know, a fast rising officer, which everybody expected her to be. At the early shows, talk about this all the time, and her mom getting mm-hmm. frustrated with her. They're all talking about, you know, how are, when people show up like her old friend, like people she's known before, like why are you still an ensign? Because she keeps getting busted back to prove something, and that's going to be eventually her arc to play out as, you know, the thing about the therapy and and the rise of Vindict and all of that kind of starts to nibble at that. But that's. That's her standing alone and not just being a font of jokes. But my point is, mm-hmm. when we when we worry about her spewing, like you said, the you know the encyclopedia of Star Trek, Chekhov once said, "I'm not that green, Sutter," and she's she's <laughs> really not that green. And her right, little ensign true. pip is a total misnomer. There, we forget. Sure, she's she's not 22 or 23. She's you know, if we let Mike's book be canon, and I want to ask him about this, if we let. Beckett Mariner be an ensign in 2371 or two, and this is eight years later, she could be 3031, and maybe Armina is has even broken Trila Scott's. Oh, I'm deep diving here, Chris, on the top of my head. If <laughs> Trila Scott beat Kirk's Captain Age youth record, and now maybe Armina has, or maybe it's not a big deal now because kids age faster and the captains are coming younger <laughs> or whatever, or maybe the Dominion War wiped so many people out they had to promote, they had to. Hopefully vet people still, but they were looking at captains getting captain rank in commands younger than had been the case before. But whatever the reason, Mariner has a lot of miles on her, which we got thrown in our face a lot in the opening shows, not so much later on. You know, like, oh, I know this, I know that. And Boimler's going crazy. Like, how did you know that? How did you know that? I'm such a right, failure. Right. And that and that's kind of gone. That's kind of gone down, too. And we've mellowed both of them out or she's opened up more about herself. But it's mm-hmm. all still true. That's part of her character. She's been so when she's spouting all this, she's been around. Not only had the years to accumulate all that, she grew up in a family where a lot, at least the the Picard Data Wharf generation through Riker, mm-hmm. through her mom, and through her own experience. And but that get that's not something we knew right off the bat or didn't sink in the first few episodes. Yeah. Right, but right. I think by after the appearance of the Titan and the Rikers, I think I, I can yeah. I can totally get all that. Yeah. Well, that's when early in our discussion, when I talked about the writing maturing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once the Titan comes and once it's revealed that her mother is the captain of the Cerritos and all this stuff happens to her, we her character is really maturing and settling down. And yeah, all the stuff you say makes sense. I'm curious about the age thing, though, because in Envoy's second episode, when she is fighting with the Klingon. Right. She tells Boimler, oh, yeah, we know each other. You know, we we did some off the books gray ops stuff back in the day. And Boimler says, we're the same age back in what day? So if if that is true, then they're both still ensigns. But but you get the feeling that he's an ensign trying to climb the ladder and she could climb the ladder, but she wants to remain an ensign. So the whole age thing feels unless less likely to me. Unless, yeah, uh, uh, Boimler has been ill-advised. <laughs> yeah, which may I'm be not the case, saying yeah. she's faked her records. <laughs> in per- I mean, do people people look up each other's personnel files all the time, right? Just like we do now, we go look at LinkedIn and Facebook and yeah. you know Twitter yeah. and people's profiles. I don't know about well, the full. 
you know, I don't know who who's in charge of personnel. Is it the personnel officer or the counselor or whatever? Not, it's not HR on a I ship. I don't think it matters who's in charge. I'm pretty sure that Mariner has gone and altered her records. Yes, mm-hmm. I think you're right, Larry. I think she's done the <laughs> best, that. like classic Hollywood thing of taking five or six years off her age or something even. Yeah, I think and you, just you're, you're very- probably right about that, especially given all of her experiences. Like you say, she has to have been out in the mm-hmm. field for quite a number of years. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. But okay, so one thing that I find interesting, though, is everything you say about her experience with the Rikers and knowing things about the past through mm-hmm. her mother and Riker and other people, it all makes perfect sense. But then I think back to cases like in The Next Generation. We talked about The Naked Now earlier. If you remember there, they had to go dig through the computer records to find out that this happened to an earlier enterprise. So Picard, he didn't have all that knowledge in his head. And he's certainly been in service for a long time. Right. But look, who, okay, in the naked, in the naked now, Mm -hmm. Riker was the one who was said, I read something somewhere. He's the one that had Mm -hmm. the vague idea and went to go. So there you go. This is your six degrees of separation from Riker theory, right? Everybody, Mm -hmm. Riker's the center of everything, right? It is. (laughs) Forget Kurt, forget Picard, forget Jane. It's really Riker. It also helps if you retire into being a director. That's also really good oh, about keeping you the true. Yeah. That's, but that's no, true. I mean, that's a good, that's a good point. But it's like, I mean, when I say texture, not trivia, it's like, instead of looking yeah. at these things as, and now there's a gut settling. There's the gut feeling that we got watching the early shows, but it wasn't so much like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to snap this off and well, I'm looking at it like I'm talking about a TV dial. I'm going to click this off <laughs> and go stomp out of the room. You kept watching, but you couldn't help but having those feelings in the gut but as the show went along it felt like if there was any smoothing and and even dare i say retconning to do they would Mm -hmm. do it and that's why i'm looking you know i finally sit down with mike and have this conversation i'm just curious about how much has been pre-planned versus what's evolved as it rolled along and at what stages yeah okay so while we're talking about Riker, this is a great way to transition to it into another topic you're welcome to talk about and (laughs) But so, you know, I made the joke at the beginning of the show about you and Oklahoma and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And I I assume most people listening at this point are well aware that you're from Oklahoma because it's a very much land of, of first contact. <laughs> exactly. Where the cornfields are everywhere. <laughs> the land in, is covered in corn. <laughs> in, in timber country in southeast Oklahoma. Yes, exactly. But I. And, you know, Riker's love of jazz is well established on The Next Generation. And, of course, in the Titan novels, that theme is played up a lot. To the factor of four, five, six, seven. Yeah, exactly. And I love the names of the shuttlecraft. You know, there's the coal train you see in the background and here and so forth. But I love that we see Boimler on the Titan and they're in the middle of a battle. Everything's going crazy. And Riker stands up and he goes, red alert. I'm starting to think this jam session has too many licks and not enough tongue, which I immediately got as a trombone player myself. I immediately got the whole uh-huh. joke about licks and tongue. And Boimler says, what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I love that line. I love how they're playing Riker's character in Lower Decks and the transition to another theme is guest stars. So when when Lower Decks first started and we're thinking about, okay, they're going to do a humorous animated series of Star Trek. How is that going to play out? And as they go along, they're getting all these actors, mm-hmm. actresses who we know playing their original characters, voicing their original characters. We get John Delancey has a little bit of Q. And then, then, of course, Jonathan and Marina Mm -hmm. come in as the Rikers and the Titan shows up. And I was just curious about your thoughts about how important getting those guest stars has been to really hooking fans on lower decks. And also just the fact that these actors who we love from the live action series so quickly bought into this and jumped on board and are being part of the show. Can I just say, I think I have a bigger crush on animated Troy Marina than I did when she was, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, she's got the best bedroom eyes in that bridge to be in the middle of a crisis. And she like, but when she says, yeah. we'll talk later, 
I just that just <laughs> slays me every time. Yeah, and then we had the Tom Paris. I mean, and I, I think it's even more translated into like we were talking on the other side, the other side of the room about uh, when the minute you saw the Tom Paris plate. Two things. A, I realized that a third of fandom thought that was something cool and unique and had no idea that not only were there Star Trek plates, collector plates were like my grandma's wall. It was a thing. When we went on vacation, we brought her back a plate. So it added to her plate collection that went back to the 30s. And now I've got, you know. And and and, and then it it cracked. And then when I wanted to sell some of mine, I real 10 years ago, I went, oh, the whole plate thing is passe now and crashed. So I think Lower Decks is single handedly brought back. A, the collectible yeah. plate market, and B, told a third of America that collecting plates used to be a thing. That's the thing. Like, I, I'm sure there are a lot of people watching Lower Decks and a lot of people listening to us now who don't know about collector's plates because I don't think it has been a thing for a long time, right? But yeah. I remember growing up, you know, go to people's houses, they've got all like the NASCAR plates, all of the best drivers in NASCAR, football coaches, football players, commercials on TV gosh, Chris, asking you to you order plates. Yeah. No, my like my grandma would have like state plates, you know, they'd bring back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. 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 But, the, but anyway, yeah. But of course, and that was a merchandising thing because they had those plates ready to go with a licensed. Well, it was uh, funny to vendor, see people going, you know, well, I wish they'd had these on for sale. The minute it was in the promo, the trailer, yeah. the sneak peek thing, it yeah. was like, well, of course they have those plates. Of course they have them on for sale. Why do you think they're putting it in here? <laughs> you think <laughs> but, it's going to be T-shirts but, of the week forever? No. Right. But it was great to to have Robbie come on. We've got Tom mm-hmm. Harris on the show. And it's just been, to me, it's really interesting to see who's been on. We've had Jeffrey Combs on now, of course. We've got... They're starting to stunt cast with yeah. even more and more and more. And really, and it's good for a spike. If, you know, if nothing else that week, it's, it's the thing to talk about. And how, how much, remember we were talking about the controversy of the week, like with discovery and even Picard. Mm-hmm. And it's so good to see like the, it's not even like the Easter egg. It's the, Oh my God, this is insane. You know, shut up and take my money. Here's a spike in, in buzz online moment mm-hmm. for everything. Oh, look, it's cork on, on a billboard. Oh, look, it's, yeah, it's Tom. It's, it's, it's Robbie. Oh, look, it's, it's Jeff Combs all the way through. And more of that, you know, you know, more of that's mm-hmm. coming and they're, they're working. It's probably like, here's the list of people we'd like to get in, but we only got a 22 minute show 10 times. So without looking gratuitous, how do we sprinkle these through and have them be organic? Right. But, but right. it is at the time. It's what I said about Picard. It's like, get out of thinking about the, the same people who said you're ignoring DS9. I've been the one saying, look, don't get out of these boxes of series. It's just that time, the late 24th century Mm -hmm. is the time when the majority of Star Trek we know was filmed. So you've got all those people living in that time and they're floating around doing various things. We can catch up. Maybe they're maybe they're being heroes and promoted or maybe they've fallen on hard times or like like Seven and Picard or whatever or each of Mm -hmm. my God. So and Hugh, but you know, it's like it's just a chance to revisit all those people without having the the overhead and the weight of having them be regulars in a series, or you know, fe- crafting something totally around them. It's just it's like I say, use the universe. That's another hashtag. It's like mm-hmm. they're there, and it's not fan service. You've got forty seven other characters who walk in and out of shows with and without lines. Why is it so crazy to have people who had stature at some point? And, and even if they're like one-off baddie villains, and yeah, I mean, not everybody's a Q, but <laughs> but apparently Q's Q still because he's been back in Picard. But I mean, there are lots of you know they they make the one-off references, and for a lot of people, that's that's cool, or maybe that's too much sometimes, depending on the situation. But not to just have a mention, but then to have them actually be embodied or whatever. Um, right. But, yeah. but in the case of in the case of Jeff, just having him. You know, the joke about Jeff is he's been 47 different characters on right. on every show. Secretly, Jeff was on the original series when he was seven. Did you know that? <laughs> well, he was Nomad, right? He was the other, yeah. <laughs> he was the, he had a scene as Clint Howe, as Baylock's servant, but they had to cut the scene <laughs> out of Corvamite Maneuver. Not I many see. people know that. <laughs> yeah. So that's why that was. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, I just, I feel like. Lower Decks would be loved regardless, but bringing in all these guest stars, I think, has made it even more loved. Oh, yeah. But also, it lends a legitimacy to it, to the people mm-hmm. who want to say, like, well, I, and this I encounter quite a lot online, actually, the famous debates over what's canon. 
people say, oh, Lower Decks isn't canon. Why is it not canon? Well, because it's animated. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> you know. And I think that this adds even more legitimacy to the show when you have all of these characters coming on and you have the original actors mm-hmm. and especially with the Rikers. When you've got Will Riker and Deanna Troy Riker and you've got the Titan on there, and they're bringing back characters like Sonia Gomez shows up, yes, right? And yes, Anime Tango. Yes. They're bringing all this stuff back, and I think it adds With the original legit- actress voicing, Lisa Yeah, Nass. and it adds a legi- yep. legitimacy to the show that it might not otherwise have. And also, these characters are important to the actors as well, and they wouldn't simply come back f- just for anything if they didn't believe that this was... Star Trek, and it was appropriate for this character that they've spent so many years of their life building, then they wouldn't do it. Well, I mean, you know, some people might say, oh, well, of course they'd do it. They're getting paid. But I, I don't think so as a creative. I think they need to buy into it. We need to have a 20 year people. I've seen people say this too. We need to have like a library computer image in the, in the 32nd century on Discovery mm-hmm. season four. We need to have like a California class ship pop up on a view screen on a right. computer screen yeah. and or we need to have 20 years older anybody <laughs> they a lot of the mm-hmm. voice talent are, are kind of on the young end that are playing the ensigns but you know we need to have somebody 20 years older come in and play uh, or if not if not the voice actor an actor portray mm-hmm. the character on picard even if it's like a moment or even if it's a view screen you know do yeah. the reverse of having the anime the tas kirk and spock mm-hmm. in the bar there yeah have the reverse of that and have have these people brought to life in real life and that would blow some people up. You there's a lot of fan artists that are out there kind of doing this. They're they're interpreting all the lower decks animation style and characters mm-hmm. as other animation style and some of them get on a on a continuum of being like realistic and there's been some realistic yeah, I've seen uh, those yeah. artwork yeah. of of the characters too. So it's, you know, people are people are ready for it. So let's talk about another topic and now this one might become a little bit negative but i think it's worth talking about oh not we us about- we're such shills chris <laughs> come on look at us just shilling we, all over the place for- we have been accused of that <laughs> in reviews and things sometimes apparently we're cbs shills i'm not exactly sure why people say that's that, why anyway. i have so many perks with cbs if you watch yeah, all the things i they, put out you'll see that's yeah. why they're just sending me stuff all the time mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but no it Pops up, I think, throughout the series, but in particular in the Kayshawn episode, Kayshawn, his eyes open. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. I'm, I'm there's, smiling. Verbally. There's a lot of dialogue, mainly coming from Boimler. He's the one that delivers most of it. But there's a lot of dialogue in that episode that feels a bit like a rebuke of Discovery and the modern approach to Star Trek. and. They talk about... You'd better have some facts to back up this supposition, mister. <laughs> Boimler talks about why he joined Starfleet. And uh, there's when they're trying to escape and he gives a big long speech and then the other Titan officers are like, yeah, you know, I I joined because I love mm-hmm. beaming. <laughs> you know, they, they got these reasons why they joined Starfleet, but they're, they're like, actually, they want to be explorers. And Boimler's saying that he wishes that he could be an explorer. He wants to be on a ship that's exploring. That's why he joined Starfleet. Mm-hmm. And then even at the end of the episode, Riker tells him, I wish I could be on a ship that's exploring and solving science mysteries instead of nonstop fighting. And he says, like on the D? He says, exactly. Yeah. Damn, do I miss that ship. Enjoy it while you have it, Bradward. But all these things that happen throughout the episode – they just talk about how Star Trek is about exploring. It's about science. It's not about fighting all the time. It's not about the galaxy ending all the time. And it really feels like they're saying, hey, can we can we kind of roll back what we're doing with Star Trek right now with these newer series and get back to telling stories mm-hmm. about the characters and about science and about strange new worlds, <laughs> which we'll get and. This that, new series. That conversation you quoted was between Boimler and Riker, by the way. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's at the end of the episode. But but in the middle of the episode, there's the, the longer speech, which 
I don't know word for word uh, from Boimler. And that's the one that really right. initially caught my eye. And then on a rewatch, I notice how throughout the episode, mm-hmm. there's commentary from multiple characters along these lines of, hey, you know, let's let's get back to being explorers again. Mm-hmm. Which we even see in The Next Generation in the films, I guess. Like, I was going to say, Insurrection is, Insurrection, is Picard yeah. saying, anybody remember when we used to be explorers? Exactly, right, yeah. Right. You know, so even at that point, they're they're thinking about that because that's back during the Dominion <laughs> yes, War Patrick, time Yes, Patrick, but you wanted to have a movie contract salary. So here you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody ever got you, big bucks on a big screen for doing big science. Right, yeah. yeah. But, but anyway, do, do you feel this as well or am I just – Am I just picking on Discovery here? I don't... Well, yes, obviously you are. No, um, (laughs) that's crazy talk. You can't. You're the shill. How could you be... No, I mean, it's... I hadn't taken it that way, but I can see where, you know, subtle digs that way. And maybe it's not about Discovery. I mean, we were laughing here about the the movie formats. The movies always get... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter the era. Yeah, it's it's not just about Discovery. You know, the Kelvin films also are are the same situation. That's why I use the term Take take a look at the original and next-gen films, too, while you're at it. But anyway... And they, the one that isn't, they make fun of uh, Insurrection for not being a galaxy ending. Right. So, it's yeah. just a long episode. But th- this is why I often use the term modern Star Trek, because, you know, I'm not trying to pick on any particular series. And again, I'm not saying that Discovery doesn't have its character moments or its character development, but yeah. compared with what I now call classic Star Trek, which includes the 90s series, uh, it is action driven, plot driven. And to me, it wasn't subtle in this episode. To me, it was like really on the nose. Mm-hmm. It was like a speech about where Star Trek has gone and where it once was and how many people want to go back there. Mm-hmm. A little a little meta commentary on everything that led to Strange New Worlds yeah. and even to Lower Decks, although no one knew it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Larry, let's go back to something more positive after my little rebuke of discovery talk there. What was I thinking? (laughs) I don't know. You're going to lose your shill certificate there if you don't watch out. Yeah. I'm not going to be receiving anything else anymore. So (laughs) anyway, there one great thing about lower decks are just little details and how they weave things in through the stories that, that pay off later. It was really cool to sit down and do a lot of people have done a rewatch. A lot of people have done 47 rewatches because they're only half hour episodes. Mm-hmm. You know, they're 22 minutes, I guess, or whatever. But watching the early episodes was really revealing for things that whether it was intended or not, like the whole gag about the Hawaiians hanging out together. <laughs> but they all lied and none of them were really Hawaiian in the end. Oh, but, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, in the very first episode, I think it's when Boiler's spewing or whining or something. He says something about... Uh, uh, Hawaiian sand that made him, he was allergic to sand from Hawaii or something, but it's mm-hmm. like Hawaii gets a shout out and, and, uh, just little, little wacky things like that. And uh, there right. was one moment that caught my eye when Ransom has a throwaway line and he talks about his ex. And I was like, Oh, wait, he was, does he mean literally like married, like formally wife, not just like a girlfriend or romantic interest, which it could have been because he says his ex, but I thought, Oh, that's, that's interesting. Was, was uh, Ransom married before or whatever. But I mean, there's so many. Oh, oh, the other thing about DS9 I wanted to say, you saw Lurians in the bar. Yeah. In the yeah. Andorian bar, in the fight. There was, they were very, you know, and, and other places too. I, yeah. I just remember watching the early shows where the, the thing early on to me was like, you talk about Easter eggs. It was like, find the species, find the races, not races, right, right. species. And then it turned into wholesale by the time you got to, Kajan and uh, you know it was like here's the 40 million easter eggs we're going to visually grab it killed me also how lower decks i think even if people aren't even consciously thinking about it it started off with okay they're peppering like when tendy gets off there's a benzite right behind her getting off and then it's it winds up being the benzite that's in the red shirts you know like there's one benzite that's around and there's some uh, there's some races that there's some species that you can tell they're making an effort to copy there was one yeah. that's blue. They they almost think they were Bolians or or um you know bald. They're baldish like a Bolian, yeah. But they have droopy ears and they have right. spots on theirs. And I was like, that looks. And there's two or three of them. And they're so good on the show about when they create a background person. That's why the the uh, episode about the training 
when they have that one master shot. I have not sat down yet to count all the bodies in that master shot, but it looks like the rec deck scene of the motion picture where they're trying to put uh-huh. everybody, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. or the movie yeah. scene on, on, um, on discovery. I want to count them, but there was a species that's been on for, and I finally saw it. It's there's one of the prisoners in the prison on, uh, in, in Star Trek six. It's like just a one off uh-huh. alien extra, uh-huh. but it's a beautiful headshot of this. It, it's all there. It's like the, the blue skin bald with the droopy ear tips and, yeah. and kind of the big, like bold freckles ish. Right. And kind of an older, I was like, look, somebody saw that fly by and went, let's use that one for one of our, and that's a whole yeah. thing about how those, but what's great is when you see those and you see even the humans, like there's the curly headed guy or there's the girl with the visor or there's the Andorian girl and late girl, Jennifer. woman. And, but, but yeah, but that's, that's my point. Eventually those people become Fletcher or Casey yeah. or Jennifer. Right. Yeah. And they pop out and they turn into something or, or yeah. Lundy. Chief Lundy right. was the guy at the transporter, and then they gave him a weird accent. And then they even made fun of his accent. And then, and then he's got the moment where he's he's surfboarding in the holodeck. <laughs> but right. like these these characters are they're they're consistently in and out. And after a while, we yeah. know that now towel guy disappeared after a couple of times, and then later on they had a blue skin towel guy at the very right. end. But but um, you know mysteries of of lower decks. I want to know what happened to towel guy. He, apparently, human towel guy. But that whole thing about the background crew are silent, but consistent the way they used to cast to have the same, you know, same crew all the time. Even there's a guy that's an homage. We decided finally to Michael Braveheart's Martinez in sickbay. He's they gave they call him Westlake because the he's named after the composer of the Mm -hmm. show. Chris Westlake, I think. But there's a nurse Westlake. But it's an homage. It's a it's a caricature. It's a cartoon version of. Michael Braveheart's nurse Martinez, who was with Pulaski and then Crusher through the rest of the through through the series in the, in the first two movies. But mm-hmm. they do that detail. They do the detail in the backgrounds when when noticing again, when there's a Klingon talking on a communicator, by God, it's the Klingon communicator from Star Trek three, you know. Right. Yeah. When they when they're doing anything, so much of the time they've gone and they've taken the time to research the art. And that's I started to say a while ago. That's what blew me away. I was not expecting the slavish devotion, like how many hours to put into that. And and there's a bottom line here. Not only are they putting the care into these background characters, and then eventually they pull them out and making a speaking character. And I know that's evolved. I don't think they're planning somebody and then a year and a half later, season and a half later, they suddenly make them a speaking character. But they're looking at the group and going, oh, you know, let's let's do this. But the bottom line to all of this, the writing maturing – and the care that's gone into this and so few – there's been so few continuity missteps, whether it's like – I mean, the, one of the f- first ones was when Boimler's with Freeman early on and she says, watch Mariner spy on her in the first episode. And they're mm-hmm. both looking at her glass and people point it out real quick. Oh, it's like right. I remember his, that. His badge yeah. is on the wrong side. But that happens right. so rarely, much less bigger things like how but, well did okay. they draw a Batleth or a Mechleth or yeah. how well did they – you know, because so- – because Chris, yeah, it blew me away. There's they spent two years on those first ten episodes. Now that includes the startup R and D as well as making the shows. Yeah, but it's like my God, no wonder these feel so much more settled in all in writing and in look and art and everything. No wonder they feel so settled so fast. They had two years to spend on the first ten right. and a half hours. It's amazing. Well, it's annoying but amazing. Well, that also shows how much they love Star Trek because they've taken the time to research in painstaking detail all of these things so that when they draw them, they're completely authentic. We have the Lower Decks has the best prop department of any Star Trek series. Yeah. Just looking at Mariner's uh, contraband cartons will you know, keep you going for ages, much less the Colonial. Now, here's something we've talked about wanting to get to talk to people working on the show, which not many people have been able to do yet to find out little details mm-hmm. like we've learned about past series. Here's one I'm curious about. Maybe this is already known or not known, but you could imagine that Boimler's badge being on the wrong side in the reflection could be intentional because on TV shows, sometimes these little things happen as an accident when they shoot the show. So you could animate the accident to make it more authentic to an actual live action show. So are you saying that that was a, like an early day uh, prescientness of Gamato Mogato? 
Is that what you're saying there? <laughs> Could be. When the ship goes when, meta on mistakes and things. You know, maybe one one of these days, maybe we'll see an animated Cisco where his comm badge is too high up the first time he gets his new uniform. <laughs> Is it on the, yeah, is it on the gray or is it on the black? Is that could happen, a little, little rapture yeah. moment there. Yeah. You mentioned Lurians earlier, and that is one case where we see aliens on lower decks, where the timing of it felt like it was coinciding with Discovery when we started seeing all these Lurians right. at the beginning of season three of Discovery. And now we've got animated Lurians as well. And so it was kind of like, it was almost like it was an intentional thing to remind everyone that, yes, Lurians are real. They're everywhere. (laughs) Even though (laughs) Discovery's Lurians are all in the 32nd century. Exactly. Right, right. Way on down the pike. No. uh, Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, you know, that one alien that you saw in DS9 all the time and you never saw another one? They're everywhere. Can I just do one shout out though for some of the some of the wordisms and phrasings that Loredex has given us, and some of it's been in the glib, you know, the manic glib conversational. They're all ensigns. They're all supposedly twenty two, twenty three years old, right. just being manic. Yeah. But I, 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 you know, one of my favorite. I, it got to the point second season especially. There are a lot of funny lines, obviously, and some of them are funny because they're meta references. You know, they're throwing away. So there's one point where Mariner says something about, she says, you don't want to go back to Earth. All they do is sit around in holodecks of growing wine and soul food restaurants. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which, and you go, well, when did they go to, oh, yeah, Cisco's, it's Cisco's real kitchen yeah. and then Picard's yeah. vineyards. And what Which, else do we which, see outside of a Starfleet office? There's Under- another DS9 reference in Lower Decks, Larry, right there. Shh, don't, don't, you're going to spoil <laughs> their whole meme. I don't so, I mean, but, you know, just something like it got, it got to the point, though, where like one line or even one phrase a week, I just chuckled. And it wasn't like it wasn't an Easter egg. It wasn't hit you over the head. I love the line when um, Freeman, the captain, says at one point, the carpet's not always grayer on the other side, which was just so blandingly mundane soundstage, mm-hmm. you know, carpet on the set kind of thing. It just... I love that, but I I love the week they're t- they're talking they're getting a little industrial vehicular there, and she says, and Mariner I think says something about the tractor factor, which just cracked mm-hmm. me up. But the best one of all is when they're having they're they're kind of doing the throwback to the Bonisto Rec Center and Starbase Earhart and the Dom Jot table, and this is a bar that's owned by a Tellarite, yay Tellarites. Although sidebar. When we get alien races, it's including Federation members. I think it's a meme of Laura Dex that we have like a we have a Federation Tellarite captain named Durango, and we have <laughs> we have Jennifer the Andorian. Although she got an Andorian last name, I just love these human names on these you know, like non-human characters. But the best one was when the Tellarite bartender. There had been a big fight. There had been damage done. The main part. Of the scene goes by, and in the background you hear the guy go, "Oh, and I just had that table rejotted." <laughs> and I just I laughed about that for a week. Rejotted, like the Dom Jot table had to be right. jotted. Yeah, and now he has to rejot it. So I'm 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 hitting this over the head now. So I've killed it. But um, I I think I laughed longer about that one word than I had on anything that was more obvious. But I but I love Lord X for keeping the you know keeping on. Increasingly, keeping up mm-hmm. with little you know wordisms like that, which are hysterical. Yeah. Now, this isn't a wordism so much, but one of the other things they do in here that I love is how they poke fun at the way that people request things from the replicator. Yes, and you always need to specify a temperature. <laughs> and I love that scene where Lieutenant O'Connor is trying to ascend. He's doing his meditation and Tindy trips and scatters his sand everywhere. And then she goes up to the replicator and she requests colorful sand, room temperature. (laughs) And then, and then there's, well, of course the series starts with the ones where the bananas are hot, Hot. right? Hot bananas come out. And then there's the one where Boimler is trying to impress his girlfriend and he goes in dressed up like Marty McFly, whatever. He's like, he's like, Find all the cool people from Earth's history and make me an outfit. And he goes in, he orders a beer, tall, hot. I mean, cold. <laughs> make it cold. You know? And one of my favorites is in The Spy Humongous when Tindy becomes this like green 
<laughs> bug and Boimler has to make her laugh. And one of the things he asks for, he says, computer, birthday cake, lit candles, various temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> various temperatures. <laughs> that was just it's, the over the top one. Well, that's uh, like, that it, it's like, here's the list of things they're going to make fun of at every, t- lovingly yeah. from within the family make fun of. Right. And yes. And this one is such an ongoing, it's like, it just anytime they ask for something to be replicated, there's this like snarky little comment about how you ask for things. Speaking of the spy humongous, I did want to yes. talk about Packlids a little bit because when we, we saw Packlids initially in Lower Decks, it was just kind of a joke. Right. Oh yeah, the Packlids, they're dumb. And there's that one scene where he's like, they are stealing our snacks. <laughs> and then it goes on and on. And then I love the part where we finally really see their spaceship. And he's like, this is the Packled spaceship Packled. <laughs> and then instead of a red alert, they have a red alarm, red alarm. <laughs> no, the best and- <laughs> one of all is when you find out the conspiracy, but why their ships are all conglomerates of other people's technology. Uh-huh. But at the well, actually, it's Wedge Douche, which is fast, which is amazing anyway with its structure. Yeah. But the joke scene of the Packlid lower decks, and you find out that those big conglomerated, you know, clump ships are are, uh-huh. are technically called a clump ship. Right. That's an, <laughs> clump ship. That was my word of the week that week. Yeah. The official designation, so, not a warship, but, not a battleship, not a scout. It's a clump ship. Yeah. But the reason I want to talk about pack lids is that every series has its main villain. Sometimes maybe they have a couple of main villains, but you've got the Klingons or you've got the Romulans on TNG, then the Borg, Voyager, you've got the Kazon at first, and then the Borg come along later. You've got the Sulaban on Mm -hmm. Enterprise with the Temporal Cold War storyline. And in this series, and and DS9, of course, you've got the Dominion. And in this series, it seems that the Packlids are the villains of the series, but you don't really realize that that's happening until you get to the end of the second season and then Freeman is arrested for destroying the Packlid homeworld. And then you think back to the events from a few episodes earlier. And then when you rewatch the first two seasons, you notice how the Packlids are like slowly becoming more important to the story. Right. And I think it's really hilarious and also very appropriate that the Packlids would be the big baddies of an animated it's, comedy series. It's totally it's to- totally lower deckery. I mean, you know, when they were first on, it made total sense. If if lower decks, if the Cerritos and the lower deckers if the lower deckers are the B team of the Cerritos and the Cerritos is by extension the B team of Starfleet. Well, who's the B team of all the aliens adversaries that are out there? They mm-hmm. kind of stumble into being it. Well, the Packlids are about the best you could get to. So it totally made sense. And then even even when you find out what's going on with them and they do get dangerous and they are an actual threat, then you find out they're just the stool pigeons for this renegade not the not the entire Klingon Empire, but this renegade Klingon who's been arming them yeah. apparently. Yeah, and it so you've got a you've got a rational sense that's not just for comic, because <laughs> everybody loves to make fun of the Packlids, but you've got like a rational canonical thing that kind of makes sense. And I've even seen some people online say that maybe that was another case of Star Trek making a commentary about <laughs> major powers and you know uh, yeah. bad leadership uh, manipulating maybe lesser <laughs> lesser able leadership of other empires and governments. Right. So. Yeah, 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 it could, could be. But I, I think it's just hilarious how they're using the Packlids and the portrayal of the Packlids is so funny. Well, you know, I, th- I, can I can I bring up something else here? I think even we've got these two seasons and there was a lot of closure with this. But there's some there's some mysteries that have been like lingering around. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, uh, Lower Decks. And we go into the third season and they're already, you know, Mike has been out talking, Mike Mac. Uh, McMahon has been talking about uh, some of the, you know, spicing up some of the characters, and they've already talking about what to do with with Tana and Shax, and maybe some, you know, and maybe even Mariner and Jennifer, maybe whatever. But but um, mm-hmm. I'll tell you one moment that a was very intriguing and you didn't see coming was that moment in the finale where just for a second, when it was very sweet, when Rutherford dumps his his uh, implant again he, a that he had kept three copies of all of his memories oh right yeah 
that's another thing. Like, what's going to happen with those two? Is it tur- is it turning into the you know the reluctant couple that don't get together till finally the very end? And I don't even think it's like high on on Mariner and Boimler's list, you know, of things to do. Or oh yeah, we all know that. And maybe they do, but they just never talk about it. But you feel like they're going to play keep playing with that because it's been around since the beginning and it comes and goes. You know, on top of what they said after the first year was like, why do it's always Mariner and Boimler off together? It's always Rutherford and Tindy oh, off we together. Talked about- that right at some point i think yeah right and they you can tell they and then and then mike and his staff talked about it and you technically and you they even then it was even like a meta thing where they even make a joke about how mariner didn't know her first name i thought tendy was your first name oh, right yeah <laughs> that was that was the most perfectly meta moment ever because that's like most of fandom i think was like, i thought tendy was her first name i'm with you Boiler. you know i mean mariner that but also to, feels to, a bit to, like a reference to uhura and how her first name wasn't known for so long. Oh, you're just deep diving way out the back end. <laughs> but I mean, but you can tell that some of the things they did a step back and looked at some basic you know, structures of the show and went, you know, yeah. you're right. We do need to mix this up and and not just have them always walled off that way. But anyway, but but the, the thing about Rutherford, there was two seconds when he's resetting his memories of her and you're just going, oh, he kept three copies and all that. And that's, you know, but then he's passing out and coming to and, you know, when he's redoing that. There's a moment where you see the two shadowy figures talking mm-hmm. about how, what if he ever finds out what we're doing? And with just very little said, you get that, A, they're in shadow because something sneaky. It's like there's some Treadstone, Jason Borney stuff going on here or something. Mm-hmm. And we don't know. And then, and it flies by. So it's totally just a seed that's planted that they're going to get back to in the future at some point. But then, again, going back and doing this rewatch... At the very beginning, when they're introducing the character and what's going on with his, and when you first met him, it was messing up and he was having to reset it, his his implant. But they called it a Vulcan implant at the very beginning. Earlier in the series. Early at the, the, the pilot of that episode. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Right. In the pilot yeah. episode, he calls yeah. it a Vulcan implant and it's malfunctioning right. and he was kicking it around. And it was part of the, the humor of the show. But in Veritas, yeah. you know, the truth horn, the horn of <laughs> the horn of candor, <laughs> not <Yeah>. canter. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> During Rutherford's, you know, time at the Horn, he's yeah. going through this whole elaborate uh, black ops bit he did with Shax and and Billups. Yeah. And by the way, shout out to the whole SCA show, the whole medieval recreationist Ren Fair show that was hysterical, and and great great back. It's it's kind of like when Jordy finally got a backstory episode on the original series when Billups. Mm-hmm. You know, we find out the engineer's backstory, but anyway. In those flashback scenarios, when Rutherford's just saying what he's what happened to him, to him to himself on that caper, he keeps having to reset. He's having problems, and he's resetting his implant there, and he keeps waking up with elapsed time going by, and he doesn't know what's going on. And early in that, he 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 comes to again, and he's in a shuttle with two unconscious Vulcans in front of him, and and sh- and they're all in their black ops. They've all taken Vulcan disguises. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what's going on? He goes, boy, you sure did ner- neck pinch those two guys. And he says, I don't know how to neck pinch. And he goes, well, tell that to Spock and Spock here. But then but then Rutherford says something effective. Oh, I guess my implant must have taken over. And I fell off my chair because that totally flew by me in the moment. But it's like his. So it's not like he has he's consciously aware of it, but he has a vibe about it. Like it has all kinds of information. Like they come to him and say, do you have. Information on old Romulan <laughs> maintenance and repair manuals for their ships, you know, on your, oh, I probably do somewhere in here. <laughs> right. And he, and he did, and they got the yeah. bird of prey fly. I mean, you had right. to, I had yeah. to watch that two or three times to stitch the story together, but it was great. But my point here is we just had that scene in the second season finale that there was something ominous and not, you know, okie dokie <laughs> about his implant and who put it there actually. And that maybe he even has a false story. Very Jason Borney about this. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a clue last season at the end of the season there that he there's a lot going on there that he doesn't even go go to. Even as he purges it and, you know, resets it and reboots it, it's still there in the hardwiring of it. So that's a that's a of all these things. That's a mystery that to me is is that. But all these people's background, you got Mariner's background. His is still kind of mysterious. We saw Tendy's family and. Maybe that's why I loved I loved it when in Invicta, aside from Invicta being an insanely classic show, just like Wes Douge for the structure and where they went with it. But there's the moment in in um, 
in, in in the rise of Invicta, where she she says she keeps making her an Orion pilot, Orion pilot, and finally she says, "Hey, hey, not all Orions <laughs> are like you know thieves and pirates." And she's like, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry." Like then she kind of yeah. says like ninety five percent of them are, but that's beside the point. I'm not. But then they have the episode where she goes back and visits her brother, and you see, yeah, he's totally in a criminal organization. But anyway, I'm looking for, and we haven't, we don't really know anything about Boimler's family really either. So, right, you know, right. much less more on all the cast. But I, that's all things that are down the line. You can't expect that. But I'm, you know, there are some, there are plenty of mysteries still hanging around out there about. Well, yeah, response. well, there are a lot of mysteries, and the second season even ends on one with Freeman being arrested for the right. destruction of Packlid Planet and where that's going to go, how that's going to play out. The the thing about all these little point, you do have to rewatch. I mean, when decks. when when the when the security ship with her pulls away, I mm-hmm. so wanted Ransom to look toward the aft and say, "Mr. Shacks, fire!" But they didn't go there, so. <laughs> You really do have to rewatch Lower Decks episodes many times to catch all this stuff because not just the references, but right, of course right. the there's Easter so many of those you have to you have to find them. They get the headlines. But, yeah. but there's so much stuff going on that even these little points, like you mentioned about Rutherford's implant at the end of the first season, a reference, mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff gets lost in all the noise of the references. And but they are building real stories. And they are planting the seeds for storylines and there are mysteries going on that will be unraveled over time, like on any series. But sometimes those things are a little bit harder to recognize in Lower Decks because there's so much other stuff going on around it all the time. But but as you rewatch, you do see those things. And one... <laughs> final humorous thing sort of related to that, which I did not pick up on when I watched the finale. But when I went back to do a rewatch, I noticed is that in the final episode, First First Contact, when Tindy and Rutherford go down to Cetacean Ops, the dolphins really want them to get undressed and come swim skinny dip with them. Oh, you noticed that, huh? And the, the, yeah. Well, that's very obvious because they're very insistent. Like, you really should do this. But what I had forgotten was that in the first episode of the season, Rutherford is on a date with Ensign Barnes. And mm-hmm. Ensign Barnes invites him to come down and go swimming with her and some of the girls from Cetacean Ops. So it's like bookending the season with a skinny dipping reference, which the first time... The first time you don't think much about what she says in the first place, and you certainly don't think that they're skinny dipping. But when you hear the dolphins at the end, and then you go back to the first one, you think, oh, they're skinny dipping in cetacean hops. Like, this is something that goes on. Rutherford could have been doing that. He didn't go. And and now at the end, they're like really trying to get Boimler to strip down and... Mm-hmm. and hop in so that's, those kinds of things are really funny and they go by very quickly and there's a lot of connecting the dots that you have to do with lower decks there's one more ds9 homage oh that i want to make sure we got that out. i i figured this out well it's it's subtle but you have to be there have you noticed that now the the little rattle traps uh shuttle that they keep in their repair bay at least in the first season that they scrawl a name on it so you know all the shuttles are named for national parks in california the ships right. are named for cities the shuttles yeah. are national parks. But of all the shuttles, the one that they took, at least in the first season, I, I should update this, but at least in the first season, the the shuttle that they always took on the main missions, you'd see them all lined up and you could read the names. But the one that got out for the action was always the Yosemite. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, what? and it hit me on this rewatch. I'm like, oh, it's like they all they have all these shuttles, but they're always in the Yosemite because that must be the filming model. Just like on DS9, <laughs> they had the three runabouts, but the only one yeah. they ever took off for a nice long tracking pack, a passing shot where you could see the name on the actual miniature was the Rio Grande, right? So it's like of right. all the runabouts DS9 had over the years, the Rio Grande is the only one that survived <laughs> because they That's... didn't want to repaint the model. So there's your deep cut wow. DS9 of all. They probably had no <laughs> – I'm sure that was just so intentional. But hey, plus I'll take a, it and run with it. Yay. Plus a production deep cut where they're they're actually most likely referencing the realities of filming a live action series. They didn't want to have to repaint that animation file. Right. <laughs> I love that. 
All right, Larry. Well, any final thoughts on Lower Decks? Oh, that was my final thought. No, I just, it's a, it's amazing. Just just keep on what they're doing. I think Lower Decks is great for having spawned this whole cottage industry of the Easter egg trackers with podcasts and, and YouTube mm-hmm. shows. It's In a way, it's kind of sad. It's the kind of thing I would, the years I was doing my concordances, like on my own, and I would just sit down and leisurely go through these. I mean, that's such a Victorian-like concept now compared to the must get the Easter egg show done within 12 hours of the show airing, you know, kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a mania to have all 47 YouTubers and podcasts out. And and God bless them. Everybody go for it. Do that. And some of the shows, takes which a were a challenge. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of time. And some of them, like uh, Kayshawn, his eyes, his eyes uncovered. Anyway, his the collectors. Open. Yeah. The eye, yeah, the, his eyes open. The collector's items, just people were just working on that one for days and days yeah, and days. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, some yeah. of the other episodes, had, like so much stuff in the background. And so many of these episodes, they all, and people have given, you know, entire programs to dissecting all of these. But overall, kudos to, to uh, <laughs> Lower Decks for mixing, A, just the outright references, to B, this kind of meta in the family having fun. Like not outsiders making jokes. Are you laughing with us or at us? And and Lower Dex's entire team, from Mike on down, is obviously laughing with Star Trek and the Star Trek. Oh family. yeah, definitely. And that's a then surprised a lot of people that not only were they worried about what the comedy would look like, they didn't expect the comedy to be so good. I was, as I said, mostly shocked that the level of visual detail was it. You know, it's it goes all the way from recreating a known prop or setting faithfully, or even like a wacky moment you know to designing something new where it feels it feels yeah, right right but just taking that time to do that i mean on all these levels and that's why and even the levels that people didn't expect like you said fulfilling that kind of old-fashioned format of a show mm-hmm. even in this scary animation comedy format that people were worried about i mean it's just it's just as the brits say that lord x is like ticked all the boxes and some mm-hmm. of them people were worried about and some people didn't even fans didn't even think about thinking about until after it happened and realized. Yeah. So, you know, well, let's it's, also, it's not a shock for me to hear people say it's their favorite, not only of the modern treks, but it's their favorite overall. And they're not turning in their next gen or DS nine fan club card. They're mm-hmm. just saying, look, it's embracing everything. Yes. Even DS nine, <laughs> it's embracing <laughs> <DS9>. everything, <laughs> you know, and well, while it finds its own way. Well, let's also acknowledge that, one reason the comedy is so good and works so well is the cast. The mm-hmm. voice cast is brilliant. Oh, yes, yes, and yes, yes. The way they bring the writing to life really makes a huge difference. That might sound obvious, but it really, this could be in the hands of very talented voice actors who just don't quite elevate it to where this group does, but I think this group has just been fantastic. I can't wait to hear the casting stories for the voice act, which is a new, you Mm -hmm. know, even the animated series was just bringing everybody over. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not even everybody, you know, Walter, sorry, Walter, we don't have the money. We barely got George and Nichelle in here. And then Mm -hmm. having Jimmy and Majel and and Nichelle a little bit doing all the guest voices. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Aside from Stanley Adams and Mark Leonard as Sarek. Hey, you know, in a sense that just, that just remind me in a sense James Dewan was the Jeffrey Combs of the animated series. Uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> but I, it'll be interesting to hear the casting stories for the voice actors yeah. as it goes along. But uh, but it, it's been you know good on them for getting the voice actors out there front and center, so that you know, even though they're the voice actors, uh, unlike like the the obviously when you have the actors, much less the writers, but the actors of the live shows, you know them. But they've done a really good job of getting. All the the voice talent right. for all eight or nine of the of the regulars and and even more so of that but definitely it's it was a good it was all good casting and I I feel like just like the live action like when you Spock McCoy was not a thing until you saw the dailies and they saw Leonard and D interacting Jed Zia and and Worf was not a thing until they saw the dailies of how Terry and Michael's mm-hmm. sparks flew and then they started right. writing to that. And in yeah. lots of other cases, too. And, you know, like the, they're being animation. They're letting these voice actors, they have the freedom to do it in a booth without a lot of overhead. There's mm-hmm. time ticking, but it's not like there's a crew of 20 or 30 people. It's the voice booth crew. <laughs> so 
So they right. let them improv and they let them they let them have fun. And that's the reason why out of the blue, a total accident, Jennifer the Andorian is Jennifer because and maybe we mentioned it before, but it was just it was just, you know, they're letting um they're letting her free form and she just says, Get out of my way, Jennifer, or whatever it was was the thing, and they just kept it and then when it got animated, it was the female Andorian that you'd actually seen in the first episode when, or the second, when Boimler's talking about how Mariner didn't know a Ferengi from a Bolian, you know, <laughs> right. and they've got the Andorian girl sitting there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And yeah, they, yeah. And, but you know, she's, she doesn't have, just like in the original series, when all the series, when you'd had the familiar faces and yeah. finally one of them gets to have a line, it's that same kind of feeling. And then, but that's why it's like an Andorian named Jennifer. What is the deal here? So kudos to them for not only casting well, but letting them have the freedom in the booth that animation allows Yeah, to, to find right. those things and then to f- come up with even kind of like Robin Williams doing the genie in the original. That, that's exactly what I was just thinking about. I remember mm-hmm. listening to this was God, maybe 20 years ago now. I remember listening to a recording of Robin Williams doing an interview. It was like inside the actor's studio, but it might've been a different show. I can't remember now, but he was just talking about how like 80% of the Jenny and Aladdin is him ad-libbing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, when you let them go like that with, with great people, it, things happen. Just letting Tawny go, but all of them yeah. doing that. And Jack Quaid, yeah. the Boimler, now it's becoming yeah. a thing that's about to, somebody was talking about it's eclipsing the checkoff screen. They were laughing about how they've got 47 different Boimler screams recorded and they just pull <laughs> one out. to. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's been fun talking about Lower Decks, covering two seasons at once, Larry. It's Whoa. amazing. That we it is. Out, but Let's not do it would... again. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll do season... one at a t- yeah. Let's do season three just uh, as season three. But we would love to hear your thoughts on Lower Decks and how it has played out Thus far, if you'd like to share those with us, there are many ways for you to do that. A great way is the Babel Conference. That is our listeners group. You can find it on Facebook. Uh, Just go to Facebook and type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field, and it should come up. If not, just type the whole name, the Babel Conference. You'll find a post for this episode there, and you can talk with us and fellow listeners about Lower Decks and what we talked about here on the podcast today. That is a closed group. If you're not already a member, I do need you to answer the questions that you'll find when you join the group and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. If you'd like to send email, you can do that by going to our website, trek.fm slash contact. Use the form there. Choose to send to a show and choose the ready room, and that will come to us by email. And of course, you can find the network on Twitter at trekfm is our username, and that's our username pretty much everywhere. Now, Larry, when you're not trying to get Mike McMahon to animate you and actually put you into the third season (laughs) of Lower Decks as Dr. Trek himself, where can people find you? Tell everybody what you have going on right now. I feel like to keep history going, they should just make give me the name of a make me the name of some shuttle that's going to kill Captain Freeman or something, (laughs) you know, to keep the continuity going with the Mm Nenebeck from Final Mission. Oh, no, right. hey, I'm right there at LarryNimichek.com, Larry Nimichek on Twitter. Every other social just about is Larry Nimichek's Trekland. I really would love it if people would come over and subscribe on the YouTube because I put my interviews up there. But also that's where Trekland Tuesdays live at 1 p.m. Pacific Tuesdays uh, and, and Saturday mornings live support live with Dr. Ali Matu that I also co-host at 10 a.m. Pacific on Saturdays, 1 Eastern. We put the the replays, you know, the the archive bits are all on my YouTube. I didn't start promoting it till recently, so I'd love if everybody could go over and subscribe on my YouTube channel. And of course, for pure podcasting, I do need to give a shout out to our podcast, The Trek Files from the Roddenberry Podcast. That drops every Tuesday as well, where we have a document from Gene's Files with a guest. And we have some awesome guests coming up on some uh, all kinds of facets of Star Trek and media and culture and all that good stuff. But LarryNimichek.com is where everything is. And the big thing coming up, I have a, a – if anybody's doing the short version makeup session San Diego Comic-Con over Thanksgiving weekend, which I know is kind of a weird thing, I, I'm going to have a panel at 4 o'clock Saturday there, the, my Star Trek State of the Trek forum. And then going to be all over the Nichelle Nichols farewell convention. If you hadn't heard, they finally, after a year of COVID delays, year and a half – have it attached to the L.A. Comic-Con that itself has been delayed to the first weekend of December. 
So you can look up, I think it's uhura.space and see all about the uhura. It's separate but attached. And you can buy one ticket to go to both events in downtown LA. That's happening. But most of all, I mentioned that. I'm so thrilled. This year, our sixth anniversary open house for Portal 47, where we throw the gates open for everybody to come see how we do our portal business telebriefings. Mike McMahon is going to be my guest. And that's November 17th. A quick editor's note. After recording this episode, this session with Mike McMahon was moved to Monday, November 15th. Not the 17th, but the 15th. Everybody can go over to larrynimichek.com slash open house or just follow the links you see and just get your, you know, sign up your virtual ticket. Even if you're on my list already, just do that so I have a head count. And then you're also, that count is also for people to be in for the door prizes we'll give away that night. But that'll be 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 Eastern, an hour with me going at Mike. A lot of the kind of tone we're doing here, we'll do big picture things. And Except he knows a lot more about Lower Decks than I do, Larry. Oh, really? Oh, (laughs) okay. Well, then I'd better better, like add on to this question list then. So, okay. (laughs) I'm really looking forward to it. And of course, people... Once you're in, you can send me questions to ask him to. But I'm 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 really looking. We've had some great, you know, we've had Renea Chavaria and Mike Westmore. Mm-hmm. Be our, the open house is where, you know, normally Portal 47 is a subscriber service. But the open house is where we tro- show everybody how it all works once a year. And I'll have a mini round table in there. People can talk open mic and we'll have some prizes. And at least an hour with Mike, you know, me getting to, to ask him all the things that I wanted to ask. Big picture. And maybe some specifics and also people's chance to send in questions, too. So we're looking forward to that. But that's over at my site. You can find your way there. And I hope everybody uh, here at Ready Room will, will can join us that night. Sounds exciting. I am going to try myself. I don't know. You know, the time zones are hard to line up. Yeah, it's, it's wacky for anybody. I know. Los I know. Angeles. But that's very exciting. And I would love to hear Mike on there. That's awesome. So everyone go check that out. And if you'd like to catch what I'm doing, I don't have all the cool stuff going on like Larry does, but I have a few things happening right now here on the network. Uh, It's hard to believe, but this is the 20th anniversary year of Enterprise, or as the studio prefers to call it, Star Trek Enterprise. Because how else would you know it was a Star Trek series if you didn't put Star Trek in front of the name? But it's the, this is the 20th anniversary, and uh, Matthew Rushing and I are doing a 20th anniversary rewatch of Enterprise. And we have new episodes of Warp 5, our Star Trek Enterprise podcast, which I started, I don't know, about eight or nine years ago now, I think. And uh, I've come back as the host, and Matthew has joined me. And every week we have a new episode and we're just going through one by one talking about each episode of Enterprise. Right now, the podcast episodes are dropping on the same air date as the original episode 20 years ago. I was going to ask you because that's what, right. Yes. Right, right, yes. Yeah. Now, of course, that will change when we get to season two because we don't want to take four years to go through the entire series. But for right now, we are dropping episodes so that they match the original air dates uh, of Enterprise. And it's we're having a great time. If you listen to Matthew and me on The Orb, where we talk about Deep Space Nine, it's the same kind of discussion, but we're talking about Enterprise instead. So join us wow. for that. That's exciting. Oh, I can't wait to see how your February sweeps come in, uh, Chris. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe I need to bring the Ferengi back, you know, have a few like tricks up my sleeve like that yeah. for ratings. and Just don't call them Ferengi. Well, I'll never mention their name, and I'm also yeah. not going to say anything about the Romulans, so don't no, worry. No, no, no. <laughs> or Borg. Or Borg. Mm-hmm. But that's what I'm doing right now. Also, Matthew and I do literary treks. Bruce Gibson also on literary treks, talking about the books and comics of Star Trek and interviewing the authors. Right now, Matthew is interviewing the authors with the new CODA series, which is mm-hmm. wrapping up the 24th century lit universe, which is really cool. And you can also find me on Interface, which is a Star Trek Universe podcast that I'm getting rolling. And we'll have some new episodes of that coming. And then I'm working on some behind the scenes things for the network, which will become public pretty soon as we evolve the network into TFM covering Star Trek and broader geek fandom through the 602 Club. So a lot of exciting stuff happening. 
And if you'd like to chat with me about Lower Decks or anything about Star Trek, you can find me on Twitter. My username is C Brian Jones, letter C and Brian with a Y. That's my name everywhere in social media, but Twitter is where I'm most active. And of course, you can find me in the Babel Conference, as I mentioned before. If you'd like to help us keep the Ready Room and Warp 5 and the 602 Club and Literary Treks and all this stuff going, we could definitely use your help right now through Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash trekfm, you can find out how to support the network. You can become an associate producer of your favorite show, get involved in other ways. We really do need your assistance right now with the funding of the network and our bandwidth and our hosting costs and all of that coming out of the pandemic. And I would like to thank everyone who is supporting the network right now. We really could not do this without you. So thank you very, very much. All right, Larry. Well, that was great. I got very animated talking about Lower Decks. But like you said, next time, let's just keep it to one season at a time. Sounds good to me, Chris. I'm kind of exhausted. In fact, you know, I really think it's time to stick a pack lid, not a phaser, just a spear in it. Because the ready room is done. (laughs) 